points. Perfect. Well, I'm Ashley Norman. I am currently the pro bono director at Legal Aid of Arkansas, but prior to that, I was staff attorney and leader of the domestic justice work group. So a lot of the work that I did revolved around helping victims of domestic violence. So I'm gonna start off talking a little bit about legal aid and then talking about representing survivors of domestic abuse, um, both effectively, sort of talking about the statute and um, you know the requirements of that. And then also compassionately, the things that you can do as an attorney to help a victim through this process. And then I'm gonna ask you to volunteer <laughs> because that's what legal aid does. So first, you can go to the next slide if you want. Legal Aid, our mission is to champion equal justice for low-income individuals in our communities and to remedy the conditions that burden and marginalize them. So Arkansas first began its legal services program in 1965, and there were lots of different ones who finally merged together, and Legal Aid of Arkansas was created in 2002. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we provide legal services to 31 of the 75 counties, and we do civil representation. We don't do any criminal work. And we work together with the Center for Arkansas Legal Services, which is the legal aid organization who does basically the bottom half of the state, and also Arkansas Access, Access to Justice Commission to provide legal aid for everybody. Um, this is just a map that shows the blue part is where uh, Legal Aid of Arkansas is and where our offices are, and then the green part is Center for Arkansas Legal Services. So just so you can sort of see how it's broken up there. Um, just in the past year, um, on the next slide shows the impact that Legal Aid has had. So we were able to help over 18,000 people. And of those, over 2,000 cases that we had involved domestic violence. Um, and we had an amount recovered or avoided. So that's amounts that we were able to get for the client, whether that be child support, um, other kinds of support, any kind of consumer case that they want, or debts that they avoided, um, over $4,500. And you'll see um, there that over 3,000 of our 7,000 cases were domestic. You can go to the next couple if you want. Yep, one more, please. So this is just sort of a breakdown of some of the needs that Arkansas has. Some of y'all might know this, but Arkansas has the fewest attorneys per capita in the country, with only one attorney for four, per 426 people. Um, around here, that's not that much of an issue. It's when you get farther east and south, where there's maybe like one or two attorneys literally in the entire county. Um, so Arkansas, Legal Aid of Arkansas and Center for Arkansas Legal Services helps try to fill that gap. Arkansas has a high poverty, um, ranked fifth in the nation, um, and one in four Arkansans qualify for civil legal aid. Um, and our, most of our guidelines is they have to be within the 125% of poverty. Some we can go up, but you really, we have so many people and the, the amount of money that those people bring in is very low. So, um, um, 71% of low low income households have experienced at least one legal problem. So obviously they need civil legal help. Domestic violence in Arkansas. So nationwide, more than one in three women and one in four men have experienced rape, physical violence, um, intimate partner violence, stalking in their lifetime. Arkansas is even higher. So over 40% of women have um, experiences stalking, physical violence, rape, and over 34% of men have also experienced it. In 2017, Arkansas ranked the highest um, for women murdered by men, um, and over half of those intimate partner homicides involved guns. Um, and Arkansas also has really high um, rape rates as well. So it's very sad, <laughs> but just to say that, you know, there's a need for this work um, and people to help these victims. So you can go to the next slide. Domestic abuse. So this is a wider definition. Um, the Arkansas statute is gonna limit it a lot more, but domestic violence or intimate partner violence um, can be defined as a pattern of behavior in a relationship that's used to gain or maintain power over the other. So it can be physical, sexual, emotional, e economic, 
um, threats, actual physical violence, um, blaming, injuring, um, financial, all different um, things can qualify as domestic abuse and will sort of play into that relationship. But domestic abuse, as far as in Arkansas, is limited under the statute as it has to have some kind of physical violence. So um, that is sort of a background, but we're going to move into effective representation. So I'm going to start out sort of talking about the statute and what you need to do under the statute to file for an order of protection. So as the judge pointed out, all of this stuff is state, right? So orders of protection are going to fall under state, be in state court. And um, here is the statute, the domestic abuse statute, 915-103. And this is a statute that you're going to use if you have an order of protection. So Arkansas statute defines domestic abuse as physical harm. So actual physical harm, bodily injury, or the threat of immediate physical injury or harm. And it also includes sexual contact that would be a crime under the laws of the state of Arkansas. So um, obviously you all know what that means, but it also includes rape during a marriage. So that's something that I see come through a lot. So something to keep in mind. It also limits the domestic abuse statute can only um, come into play in an intimate relationship. So that's family members, members of the same household, spouses, former spouses, children, um, and a dating relationship also. Um, there's no strict definition of what is a dating relationship and what is not. It's sort of just taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it just has to be, you can't just be friends, right? There has to be something more, whether it's one date or sexual contact or whatever it will be um, a dating relationship. So we can go to the next slide. So the first thing the person or the survivor has to do is actually go file for the order of protection. And where they file is either where the abuse occurred, where they live, where the petitioner lives, or where the respondent can be served. So any of those places you can go and file for your order. The person will go to the courthouse, um, an attorney can help them, but they do not need an attorney. They can go to the clerk's office, um, and the clerk, by statute, is supposed to help them. Um, give them um, instruction. Like they don't, obviously they're not their attorney, but they need to make it easy for them to fill out the order of protection. Some counties like Benton County don't have victims advocates and those people you can go and they will help you fill out the order of protection. Um, who can file for an order? Obviously the survivor or the victim, or you can file it on behalf of a minor who is um, a survivor or a victim. So it has to be that survivor, like it can't be the survivor's mom who feels like she wants to protect her daughter or whatever. It has to be that person um, or on behalf of a um, minor. Um, like I said, you don't need an attorney uh, to file it. Most of the time people file it without an attorney anyways, and then they get an attorney once they filed it and got their court date. And they can't charge, so there's no cost for filing or for the service. So once they file the order of protection, the sheriff in most cases is going to be the one who sort of takes it, and then they'll go try to serve the respondent. Now, cost can be assessed at the hearing. So the judge may, at the hearing, um, ask the respondent to pay costs. Um, the respondent, um, if an order is entered, will pay a $25 fee that goes to help with the domestic violence shelters. There is a part in the statute that says if the judge finds that the petitioner filed false claims or testified falsely, they can assess the fees against the petitioner. But I have never had that happen. Um, but I've definitely had it where you can ask for costs and get the respondent to pay the costs. When they're filing the order of protection, you have to disclose the litigation going on between the parties. So there's a spot on the form that says, like, is there other pending litigation going on between the parties? And obviously, a lot of times there's divorces or child custody or something. Try to disclose it. And if you get a case afterwards where that hasn't been disclosed, I would let the judge know or amend it or somehow let them know because a lot of times um, 
whether it is occurring or not, what the judge can do is interpret that. If you're trying to get around that custody case or that divorce case and get custody of your kid through an order of protection or something like that, even if that is not the case, it makes a bad first impression that you don't want to put your client in that situation. So always disclose other litigation that's going on between the parties. Once the order of protection is filed, uh, it will go to a judge and a judge will review it. And the judge will think, if, is there enough evidence for me to enter an ex parte order of protection or not? If they enter an ex parte order, what it does is from the time that the respondent is served with that order until the date of the hearing, the respondent can't talk to or communicate or um, try to call or anything, the petitioner, until the hearing date. Um, the judge also has the option if they do not think what is in the affidavit is enough, they don't have to enter the ex parte order. So basically what that means is the relationship between the petitioner and the respondent is going to stay the same until the hearing. Um, regardless of if the ex parte order is entered or not, there is going to be a hearing. So even if the ex parte order is denied, there still will be a hearing date set. Um, there is a new section in here, 915 2000, or 219, and in that ex parte order, it grants the judge a little bit of um, extra room to, to, to give some more uh, protection to the petitioner. So some of it would already be covered, right? In the ex parte, you can't talk to the petitioner, you can't call them, you can't communicate with them, you can't go to their work, you can't go to their house. Um, but 219 adds a little extra. Um, it can actually put like a physical amount of distance that has to be kept between the parties. So, you know, so many feet or whatever. One of the ones that I thought was really interesting, obviously it says that you can't stop them. It says that you can't disturb the peace, which this is all defined if you go read 219. You can't disturb the peace of another family member. So what I find will happen a lot is respondent will then go to the petitioner's mom or dad or sister and like call them and start, you know, putting all their efforts towards that person. The judge can tell them in the ex parte order that they cannot do that. Uh, another one has to do with animals. So the judge can say like, you can have temporary possession of your dog, your cat or whatever. But this comes up a lot. I've seen like horses and cows and different livestock either being like taken and still, like taken and sold underneath them during the, um, while waiting for the hearing or like cows or even people hurting animals. So those are some things to look at that the, that the judge can do um, during the ex parte order that they couldn't before. Um, so at the hearing, the respondent has to be served five days before the hearing. If they're not served five days before, um, they'll just reschedule the hearing. So in my experience, judges will reset it a few times before they just give up and say they can't find them. And most of the time that that happens, like if you file and you just cannot find the respondent, you don't know where they are. Um, sometimes they will try to hide until they know that the order has been dismissed and then they'll show up magically again. Most judges will instruct the petitioner that you can go back and refile. So um, if you find out where they are, just come back and refile. The petitioner at the hearing has to show up. Um, if they do not, their um, petition will be dismissed, no matter how bad it is. Um, a, a few counties around here, even if you want to dismiss it, even if you want it to be dismissed, you need to show up still and tell the judge that you want it dismissed. Otherwise, they will put a show cause on you and bring you into the court. So, um, Make sure your petitioner shows up, even if she wants to dismiss the order of protection. Um, the hearing has to be held 30 days. Um, within 30 days of the order, um, if the respondent, so when you get to court, everybody's there. If the respondent agrees with the order, most of the time the judge will just make sure everyone agrees and they'll enter the order for whatever is agreed upon. If it's contested, that's when you're going to have a hearing. Um, and you're going to have the hearing on the merits of, of what is in the affidavit that the client filled out. Um, sometimes, even if it's uncontested, not necessarily around here, but I've had um, a little bit farther to the east central part of the state, even if it's uncontested, the petitioner still has to give testimony and put something on the record. So I basically just 
walk through it with them, like what happened and what they could interact with. Um, the hearing goes just like any other hearing would go. Um, some judges allow you to give an opening statement and some don't, but the petitioner has the burden of proof, so they'll get up and put on their evidence first, and then the respondent will have a chance to give their evidence, and then the judge will make a ruling. Um, just one note is a lot of times pro se uh, situations happen with these. A lot of people, a lot of respondents may not, well, one, they can't afford an attorney either. Um, two, they may not understand what this hearing is actually about, and they're going to show up and represent themselves, so just be prepared for that. Sometimes it sounds like that's a good idea, but sometimes it doesn't. It's a little bit harder to get through than if there was an attorney on the other side. A thing to note and tell your client is that even if they do dismiss the order, they can always come back and file it again. Um, and we'll get to this a little bit more later, but normally it takes multiple attempts for a survivor to leave their abuser. So it's not uncommon at all for them to get to that stage and then they can't do it or they don't, for whatever reason, they don't want to do it. And you just be respectful and tell them that they can file again and they'll most likely be back. The final order, if it's granted, so the judge after the hearing, the judge either says, yes, we're going to grant it or no, we're not. If they grant it, it can be between 90 days and 10 years for the final order. There's a possibility of renewal. So if you get close to the time where the order of protection is going to expire um, and things are still going and there's still a need for the order of protection, the petitioner can go again, just like they did the first time and file for a renewal of the order of protection. And the final order, just like the ex parte, can include, exclude the respondent from uh, the house, the business, school. Um, it can give temporary custody, temporary support. Although they'll say that most judges don't really like to do uh, child support and spousal support and different things through the order of protection, but you, you can ask for it and you can get it. Um, and pretty much whatever um, else they want to order. Um, another big one here is it's unlawful for an individual who's subject to an order of protection to ship, transport, or possess a firearm. Um, there's really no enforcement on this, unfortunately, because, I mean, it's going to be really hard, right? There's unregistered firearms. There's firearms that are like, um, I gave it to my mom or, you know, whatever. So it's really hard um, to enforce it, but at least that is there. And I have um, successfully filed motions for contempt when, like, the respondent, like, uh, uh, after we get the order of protection, he's on Facebook with his new guns or whatever, and filing a motion for contempt against him for that. I don't know, but I know that it's, it's weird, but it's just something to try to do to make them get rid of their guns or hide them or something. Um, another thing with the final order, there is a rebuttable presumption if there is an order of protection entered against you, there's a rebuttable presumption that it's not in the children's best interest to be uh, placed in your primary custody. So um, just some important reminders, I guess, to keep uh, in mind is an order of protection versus a criminal no contact. So criminal no contacts are obviously those that are entered into in criminal cases, and that's different from an order of protection. And I mean, I bet you, you all probably know that, but it's something important to um, tell your clients, right? So they're like, I don't need an order of protection because I have a criminal no contact. Well, the criminal no contact would go away. For various reasons and your order of protection is going to be in place until the time runs out or it's otherwise modified and if it's modified you're going to know about it and have a chance to go to court um orders of protection uh versus mutual no contact orders so a lot of times when you go in um for an order of protection hearing um you will try to negotiate either with the respondent or the respondent's attorney um and a lot of times what is suggested is a mutual no contact order. So that's just a piece of paper that says we won't contact each other. And the only remedy for that is a contempt motion. So there's no crime if you violate the mutual no contact order. Um, you just can file for contempt. Sometimes that's an, a good solution, right? So I mean, for lots of different reasons that we can talk about a little bit more later, a mutual no contact may be what's best in that situation, but it is different because there's no crime if it's violated and it doesn't restrict the firearm possession. Um, there can be mutual orders of protection. Basically, both sides prove all of the elements. You can have mutual orders of protection. Orders of protection, again, another difference from a mutual no contact order 
orders of protection have full faith and credit, meaning you can take them anywhere in the country and you still have that protection. Some other mutual no contacts may not carry the same weight. Um, also, you can modify orders of protection. So the most common um, way this happens is if there's also a divorce or a custody proceeding or something like that, um, where let's say the judge in the order of protection said there's no visitation and there's an ongoing divorce. In that divorce, the judge can modify that order of protection allowing for visitation or, or whatever. So just knowing that it can be modified in the future. So if a respondent does violate the order of protection, um, it is a, and they get charged by the police, which is key. Um, it's first a misdemeanor, and then if they do it again within the next five years, it's a felony. Um, if you have trouble, or if the client has trouble getting the police to charge the respondent, um, or if the contact, um, the police don't think the contact is harmful contact. I mean, no contact means no contact, but sometimes the police will not um, act on what they consider like not threatening contact, you can always go back and file a motion for contempt um, in the order of protection case. Okay, so that was sort of, I just sort of wanted to go over the order of protection statute, and I know most of you already know um, a lot of that, but I wanted to also then move on to what I call a compassionate representation. So little things to be aware of or know about to represent victims of domestic abuse. So the first thing is just understanding what domestic violence looks like. So here's, you probably have seen this before, this is just the power wheel. So um, it just goes through all of the different things they can do, like using intimidation, emotional abuse, I'm using isolation. So a lot of times you'll find that victims and their spouse or whoever their abuser is have moved far away from the victim's family um, or they can't work. You know, they just like will not let them work. Um, blaming them for everything that's going on. The biggest one that I see a lot is using the kids. So either using the kids to communicate between them or using the kid as a threat. Like if you do anything, I'm taking the kids. Um, you know, economic abuse, basically not letting her have any money or like giving her an allowance. Um, and I say her, but victims can be anybody. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, your race, your age, you know, anything. And one of the biggest, I guess, hurdles or things that people are always like, man, if it's that bad, like why didn't that person just leave and just get out of that situation? I would have done that. I would have left with my kids or, you know, whatever. But there is a cycle that happens and it is really hard to get out of. And there are studies that show that it takes almost seven times for somebody to try to leave to actually be successful in leaving. And that can be for so many different reasons. A lot of times financial, they don't have money. They haven't been allowed any money. Their abuser has kept all the money for themselves. They haven't been allowed to work. Um, they've moved away from their family. They have zero support system. And a lot of them are really scared. Like, what's going to happen to my kids if I leave? He's going to take my kids from me. He's going to say this about me. He'll, you know, he's already said. Um, and so there's sort of a cycle that these relationships go through. So the first part of it is where the tension is building. Things are getting um, tense. Um, and then there is some kind of an incident. So there's physical violence, um, there's verbal, there's blaming, intimidation, something like that is happening. And then it goes to the next part where it's the reconciliation phase. So the abuser is apologizing, um, giving excuses like, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. Um, it wasn't that bad, like you're okay, everybody's okay. And then they're calm and it's sort of like the honeymoon and everything is great again. And because, a lot, I mean, a lot of times these are true relationships. These people, you know, love each other. And so, you know, the victim is like, okay, it's over. Like, everything is going to go back. It's good again. And then the whole cycle just starts over and over again. You can go to, yeah, you can go back over that one too. So I sort of broke this down um, into, like, different stages. So... The first part is the case intake and legal interview. 
So one of the best things that you can do is just believe your client. So this is going to help you build your case better if you think about it like that. But only two to six percent of claims are false claims, right? So literally 98% of the time, statistically, your client is telling you the truth. No matter how crazy or unbelievable it seems, they're telling you the truth and you should believe them. <laughs> um, there's a difference between a false claim and one that is unsubstantiated, right? So there can be, they could have gone to the police several times before, but the person didn't get charged or whatever. It didn't mean it didn't happen. It just means it couldn't be proved, right? Um, and when a client retracts, or um, this happens a lot with police situations too, like, oh, nothing happened, it's fine. It doesn't mean that they were lying about it. it just for whatever reason, they can't come forward with it right now. Um, Statistically, there's much more abuse that is underreported than falsely reported. So just believing your client is going to build that trust. And for you as an attorney, if you want to win, it's going to make you, you know, more likely to win your case. Um, but it's also just going to build up a lot of trust between your, you and your client. When you're interviewing um, your clients, asking very specific questions. Because what they're going to do when they go file their order of protection, they fill out all their information and then they fill out a page, which is their affidavit, where they just basically tell the story of what happened. A lot of times they don't put things in there that they don't consider it a big deal, but it really is a big deal, right? Like he, the whole time he was talking to you, he had his, you know, his gun right next to, right next to him. Like she might not tell you that, or that might not be in the affidavit. So asking very specific questions, like had he ever threatened to kill you? Has he threatened to kill your kids? Um, you know, has he choked you? Has he pushed you? Asking those specific questions, you're going to bring out a lot of information that the client may not tell you. And the client maybe takes a little bit of time for them to warm up to you. But also, like I said, sometimes they don't think that it's a big deal. It only happened one time. You only choked me one time. Um, but it is a big deal, and it, it is it is the the physical violence. Um, and also setting your boundaries and your expectations with the client right at the beginning is very helpful. Um, and this sort of goes along with the next one, knowing what resources are available in your area. So obviously, these people who have been through very traumatic experiences, like now they don't have anywhere to live. And they don't have any money. And, you know, they don't have their clothes with them because they left in a hurry. So knowing the resources in your community where you can help them get that help. Um, and also for them to understand that that's not you, right? Like your attorney, you can do certain, certain things. You can help them in the courtroom, but you cannot give them counseling. And you can't do these other things that they're going to need. So knowing those resources to sort of help guide them into there as well. And the last one I put on there, is that understanding that they know their abuser best, right? So if they decide they want to dismiss the case or they, when we're negotiating something, they want to do something and you're like, no, that doesn't make any sense. But understanding that they know they've been the one living in this situation for however long, they know what may trigger their abuser. Um, and they know how that person is most likely to respond and just being respectful of that as well. Um, so sort of, uh, some practice pointers. I found that clients in this situation jump around a lot. Like it's really hard to get them to nail down their timeline. Like we got married and then this happened and this happened and this happened. It, it just, there's, they've been through a lot of trauma and things just aren't going to be perfectly aligned in their brain right now. So having the patience to sort of go through that with them saying, okay, what happened? And they're like, when did it happen? And I don't know. How long ago was it? I don't know, like two years ago. So trying to, um, so I always say something like, well, did it happen in the winter or the summertime? Was it around Christmas? Was it around some, somebody's birthday? Did that happen before or after that happened? And sort of build your timeline. Um, and I always write it, write it down and I bring it with me to court because you know, you can't lead your witness, but you might be able to use that to help them get a good timeline. Because 
if they get up on the stand and they just act like they can't remember what happened and who was there and what was going on, it's going to make them look really not credible. And that's not the truth. They just are having a hard time putting it in order. So going through that with them is going to help a lot. Um, I always tell my client too, just to make them more comfortable, like I'm writing this down and I'm going to take it with me. So we're going to have it when we go to the hearing. Um, and that makes them feel more comfortable too. Um, and also to start getting your evidence as early as you can. I know, um, especially in the legal aid setting, sometimes you literally get your client like the day before or that morning and you don't have time to get evidence. But if you can, um, it's going to help tremendously. Um, sometimes police records have photos with them and you can try to get those. Um, sometimes if it is an open investigation, you may have some trouble getting them, but a lot of times if you ask the client to go get them, they'll, they'll be able to get them. Um, pictures from their phone, from a relative's phone, um, a witness. Now, a lot of times there's no actual witness of the abuse other than a, a kid or something. Um, but a witness of the injuries, like what she or he looked like afterwards. Um, a lot of text messages. People admit a lot of things that they shouldn't admit, and they do it in text messages. Um, so, and videos. A lot of times there's videos. Even if it's just the audio, somebody will just turn it on and video it, and you just hear what's going on in the background. Um, so, for trial preparation, I spend a lot of time on this with my client. I explained literally the entire process of what's going to happen from like where they park. So like, okay, we're going to Benton County. This is where you're going to park. You're going to come through the door and there's going to be officers there and you're going to go through the metal detector. And then I'm going to meet you wherever I'm going to meet you at. Um, we go over what to wear, um, especially once you sort of know your judges, you're going to know what they may or may not allow to be worn in the courtroom. I mean, as simple as like not wearing shorts. Like some judges don't want you to wear shorts in the courtroom. I mean, I've had to go out to my car and get like cardigans for my clients. So then I feel like they'll they'll be better received, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, literally just like go through every single thing about what's going to happen, where they're going to sit, um, who's going to be there with them. Um, and then obviously knowing your judges and your opposing counsel. Um, some judges don't like you to spend a lot of time on the background. Like they just want to know what happened and when it happened. And, you know, a lot of times clients may want to spend 10 minutes talking about what the fight was about that led up to, you know, whatever happened afterwards. And some judges are going to like not want you to do that. Like they're going to be like, move along. So telling your, your client that, you know, we're just going to say, you know, it was a fight over money. So, you know, just basically the real brief thing about what the fight was about, and then we're going to talk about what happened afterwards. Um, and knowing your opposing counsel. So if there are people who you know are going to go in there strong against your client, just give them a heads up because, I mean, they're scared, they're terrified, you know, and someone's going to come in and accuse them of lying and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You just really need to prepare them for that. Um, and I always tell people, it's like two things are going to happen. The respondent's either going to tell the truth and you're going to get your order and that's wonderful, or the respondent is going to lie. And most likely the respondent is going to lie. So we need to be prepared for that. Um, and that just means like emotionally prepared and also making sure your client doesn't say anything or make any faces that are going to not sit well with the judge. Um, you know, and not be like, what? So I always give them paper so they can write down whatever they want. So like, I don't care what they write. They can write like things that they think might be useful to me or they can write like whatever they want to write because no one's going to see it but maybe like liar, you know, whatever. Um, so that they are focused on that versus any outbursts in court. Um, so yeah, just telling them that the respondent is going to lie about it. Cause I just like, that seems obvious to us, but it's something that the client's really going to take personally because they can't believe that they would lie about it. But of course they're going to lie because they don't want to get in trouble. Um, 
And of course, like during trial prep, I always talk, like tell them these are the questions I'm going to ask you. And then these are the questions that the other attorney is probably going to ask you just so that they're aware. Um, and just another thing to prepare them for, like when they're answering questions, where do they look? Like they don't have to look at the respondent. They can look at me. They can look at the judge. They can look at the victim's advocate in the courtroom. Like they, you know, they don't have to, to look at the respondent. And another thing is to prepare your client for the possibility that the respondent will represent themselves, which means the respondent is their own attorney, so they get to go up and question the petitioner directly, which is, I mean, obviously the way it has to work, right? But it's very hard for somebody who is a victim of domestic violence to have their abuser asking them questions like, well, I never did that to you, did I? You know, and so just really prepare them for that possibility that that, that could happen. Um, and just, you can just ask um, your client about what the respondent is likely to be like on the stand. So do you think that they're going to get argumentative or do you think they're going to be this nice, sweet person who would never do anything like that? You know, just sort of get a heads up so that you can prepare your, um, your questions as well. Um, sort of some things going through the trial and afterwards, um, do not let them sit alone by themselves in the courtroom. Like, this is the one that makes me so mad when I see, and, and I understand that sometimes you have multiple cases or you have to go ask the judge something or whatever, but you shouldn't leave somebody who's a victim of domestic violence by themselves while the respondent is sitting over here so that you can go talk with your friends or whatever you want to do. Um, you can sit with them. You can have the victim's advocate sit with them. Like maybe they will have um, a relative with them. A lot of times judges will try to separate them anyways. So they'll have uh, the respondent go in the courtroom and uh, the petitioner go in like the jury room or something um, or sit on separate sides of the, the courtroom. But don't let them sit by themselves because, I mean, it's just not a good situation. They've been through a lot and they're already thinking about it and just be with them even if you're not talking to them. Um, and I sort of talked about this one already. Give them pen and paper so they can write stuff down um, and not talk to you so that they're not um, interrupting you, um, you know, while you're trying to concentrate on what's going on in your hearing. Uh, if necessary, you can talk to the sheriff or the bailiff or whoever and help have them help your client get in and out of the courtroom. Um, a lot of judges will like say like you need to wait here until someone leaves. But if you think that it's a dangerous situation, which a lot of times it can be, you can ask the bailiff to walk them out to their car. Or in certain courtrooms, the bailiff has a camera and he can see what's going on. And so just be aware of like safety aspects. Um, and be prepared to stand up and say something if the respondent is just glaring at your client or because this will happen a lot. And so a lot of judges will just straight up say, like, stop, whoever, so-and-so, stop looking at her. Um, but be prepared to do that because a lot of times we'll just sit there and just stare at them. Um, when I uh, question the client on the stand, I always start with, like, the background because it does two things. One, it makes your client, like, comfortable because they can say their name and they can say what county they live in. Um, but then it also just satisfies all the beginning parts of the statute. So I ask him, what's your name? What is your relationship to the respondent? So that gets that family and household member part taken care of. Um, do you have kids together? Yes or no? And if yes, has paternity been established? So that the judge knows automatically, can sort of start checking off things like, okay, they have they have the they have the relationship, they have kids, but paternity hasn't been established. So you know. Um, and also, uh, the petitioner may not want you to tell their address, so you can say, like, what county did you live in when the abuse occurred, or, you know, somehow to get the, the jurisdiction part taken care of as well. And then I get into the questions about what happened. And a lot of times I'll start out with what happened most recently, and then sort of go through the pattern um, of abuse. And the statute, like we talked about, um, only talks about physical violence or the threats of physical violence or sexual violence. Um, but I all it's I feel like it's important to also weave in those other forms of control because it just shows what kind of relationship it is, right? And gives your client a little bit more credibility that that is what is going on. So asking them about financial control or if they couldn't work or 
Um, did he call you every day when you were at work? Did he constantly accuse you of having, you know, affairs with your coworkers? Those kinds of things. Um, and why your client is on the stand, especially if there's a lack of evidence, like a lack of pictures and stuff, uh, asking your client very specific questions when it comes to um, the incidences of abuse. So um, if he choked her, like, okay, where, where did he put his hands? Could you breathe? Were there bru uh, bruises afterwards? Um, instead of just being like, yeah, and then he choked me. Like sort of making sure that you, you break it down. Um, I think that that helps, especially if you don't have photographs and things like that. Um, just a couple other um, tips, like setting them up for success in the future. Um, there's like certain parenting apps that you can use where they don't have to have direct contact, but they can still talk about the kids. Um, thinking about where to drop off and pick up, you know, just trying to get them set up um, for success in the future. And that includes telling them about um, violations and how to deal with violations of the order of protection. Number one, first, call the police, right? Whether they do anything or not, call the police. And then, um, you know, you, you can call me or call the lead or your attorney or whatever and talk about doing a contempt, but make sure that they know to call the police as soon as it happens. Um, now, this is how you can help. So um, legal aid always asks for volunteers um, to take cases or work at our clinics. So a lot of our cases, like you saw in the beginning, a lot of them are family law domestic cases, um, also guardianships, wills, bankruptcies, those types of things. Um, when you volunteer, there are forms that are available. So even if you haven't done a case like that and you're like, okay, well, maybe I would like to start doing orders of protection or divorces, we have forms available for you to use. Um, and a lot of them come with like instructions about what you need to do. Um, and even what the questions are that you ask the client when you go to court. Uh, we also have malpractice coverage for you when you're volunteering. So that's wonderful. You can get CLE hours for volunteering also, which is cool. And you get to help people. So it's very rewarding. If you want um, to help, um, you can go to our website and you can fill out this little application uh, on there or you can contact me, but it basically just wants to know um, your information and what you might be interested in helping with. And you're supposed to do pro bono hours every year. So call me and we can do them. Informed lawyering. I'm obviously not a lawyer, but I work at the VA during the day as a therapist for veterans with moderate to severe PTSD. Some of you might know that we have one of the United States best treatment programs for veterans here in Arkansas. Veterans that have PTSD here in Arkansas, it's in North Little Rock. It's um, one of the highest rated programs in the United States. We get vets from all over the country. They come see us there. So if you ever get in a situation where you have a veteran with PTSD, think about us. We, we, had, we were on 60 Minutes about eight years ago for our treatment and things that we do there, and it's really awesome. So this is a passion topic of mine, trauma-informed care. So I appreciate all of you being willing to listen to me for an hour and talk about this. So thank you. Okay, here we go with the slides. So I want to just kind of start with what is trauma. Most of us know what we think trauma is. A lot of times people think trauma is about an event, and a lot of times it is. It's an event. It can be a natural disaster. It could be combat. It could be a rape. It could be a physical assault. But trauma really is an emotional response. It's how the person responds. What may be traumatic for you, I may think is funny. So it really is about the person's experience to the event. Put simply, trauma is an event or an experience that overwhelms a person's normal coping mechanisms. I need to say this mic, okay. All right, it, um, overwhelms a person's normal ability to cope. It can be all kinds of different things. Like I said, it may not seem traumatic to you, but if the person feels that their life was in danger or someone they love was in danger in that situation, that could lead to them having a traumatic response. I don't have a clicker, so she's having to read along with me here. So a lot of times you hear about trauma in relation to ACEs, which are called adverse childhood experiences. 
Um, if you don't know, the CDC did a big study back in the 80s, or Kaiser Permanente did the study, the CDC now does it, in the 80s um, at their hospitals in California, and they um, queried people about their experiences with trauma, and they were really shocked that the numbers of people that had experienced trauma in their life. And so ACEs are really about things that happen to us in childhood. They can be abuse, they can be neglect, they can be household challenges like domestic violence, a parent going to prison, substance abuse in the home, uh, a parent or a guardian with mental illness, um, incarceration, I've said that, even divorce is considered a um, adverse childhood experience on there. So people with ACEs of six or more usually die 20 years before others. Uh, eighth of the population have more than four ACEs. And we think of ACEs, a lot of times we think about mental health issues, but they actually also affect physical health issues. I'm going to have to actually keep going because I, I remember it, but I don't remember all of it. So, <laughs> but ACEs in Arkansas, as you can might imagine, as a poverty stricken state here in the South, we have a lot of kids with high ACEs scores. Uh, in 2016, you can see there, um, if you can see this PowerPoint, my eyes are pretty bad, but um, you can see that in Arkansas, we had um, parents served time in jail. Arkansas rate 16% of kids. National rate was 8%. Extreme economic hardship for Arkansas, 31% of the kids, 25% nationally. Uh, the Annie Casey Foundation just released their latest data for Arkansas on their Kids Count data book. Um, every year they release data for all 50 states about how they are um, for child welfare, child living environment, just child, how, how it is to, for a child to live in this state. Arkansas dropped. We were 39 last year. We went to 43 this year. So we're in the bottom 10%. Something striking that came out this year where there's a 1.5 million more kids in Arkansas that are saying that they are experiencing depression and anxiety. That's a tremendous amount of children. And when you think about that, it takes five years for the average person with depression to get help. Those are a lot of children out there in our state that are experiencing some difficulties right now. So we know that those numbers are high. Those kids are going to grow up, right? Those kids aren't going to stay young forever. Those ACEs are going to continue to affect them. But we know ACEs don't just come from the home. ACEs can also come from the environment. So there's also adverse community environments. There's things that happen in the environment. There's kids that live in very difficult situations. The life expectancy for people that live and grow up in Benton County, Arkansas, is about 12 years longer than people that live in Phillips County, Arkansas. So if you're born in Phillips County, you probably are going to live 12 years less than somebody that was born in Benton County. The statistics for life expectancy for Phillips and Lee County in Arkansas are on par with Burma and Myanmar, or Myanmar, which used to be Burma. So when you think about that, we know that the environment also affects how people are growing up. Poor housing quality, violence in the community, lack of opportunity lack of economic mobility, different kinds of community disruptions, all those things can affect people in negative ways. And the ripple effects of ACEs across the criminal and juvenile justice system. You have those adverse childhood experiences, biological, emotional, negative impacts on development, cognitive issues perhaps as well. Those ripple out into aggression, into defiance of authority, into connection or um, getting involved with law enforcement, jails, detentions, and then they get in situations where they're re-traumatized by the systems that they are in. We know that our systems aren't built for people who are experiencing trauma. So when we look at this, this ACE pyramid, you see the adverse childhood experiences are on the bottom. The next level says the damaged, damaged disrupted neurodevelopment, social emotional and cognitive impairment, and then adoption of health risk behaviors. For a really long time, we thought that's why people were dying early. They experience trauma as children or early in life. They go on to smoke, drink, eat, overeat, adopt poor behaviors, 
which then leads to disease of early death. What we now know is it actually happens right there at that disrupted neurodevelopment. When you bathe a little kid's brain in traumatic stress, hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, those things cause hormonal imbalances. And for a long time, people didn't realize that those were the things that were actually impacting development. It was obviously the later behaviors as well, but that chemical hormonal stuff that got out of balance early in childhood went on to cause additional health problems. People with higher ACEs have higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of COPD, higher rates of diabetes, all kinds of medical health problems. So we now see the effects of chroma medically. When we talk about trauma, we can't help but talk about PTSD too. So that's what I do all day, every day is deal with a lot of PTSD. So sometimes people aren't sure what is PTSD. If you've had trauma, that doesn't mean you have PTSD. Very few people actually develop PTSD as a result of trauma. It's usually only about 10%. Most people have a traumatic experience, have some symptoms, but those symptoms will go away or reduce over time. If they're still there one to three months later, you got to have help. You're not going to be able to get better by yourself. It's like substance abuse life times. You won't be able to do it by yourself. You've got to have come in and get some professional help. So what trauma can look like for somebody in everyday life? When you come into contact with people, whether they're victims of domestic violence or any other kind of issue, these people are probably going to come out and tell you, I've experienced trauma. A lot of times people don't code it as trauma. They don't actually... Um, identify it as a traumatic experience. Sometimes they do, but I can't tell you how many clients I've had telling me about a sexual assault. And I said, wow, that was right. Oh, no, that wasn't. No, 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 no. no, let's go back. Here's what you told me and repeating it back to them. And they're shocked. And I, I heard an episode of This American Life recently, the podcast that said something like 70% of women who've experienced sexual assault don't identify as so these folks won't always tell you that it's trauma, but what it looks like in day-to-day -day life is addiction, alternative things, self-medicating, avoiding. Avoidance is a hallmark of PTSD. So they'll sit with their back to the wall. They want to be able to see the entrance and the exits. They have a lot of hypervigilance. Their head is on swivel. They're always on guard. They're really noticing they're at that high level, that cortisol, those high level hormones are still active for people with PTSD and trauma. They'll have that hyper arousal. They can have high anxiety, really irritable. Mood issues we see. Often depression comes along with that. They can be suicidal at times. Often there's nightmares, flashbacks, and they'll dissociate. They may be physically here. Their mind has gone somewhere else. That's often what people have to do when they're in the middle of a trauma, in the middle of a rape, or in the middle of a combat situation. They will be physically there, but in order to survive and get through it, their mind associates and goes to a different place. And so sometimes you'll see that. I'll see that with clients. I'll be talking to them, or we'll be in a group, and they are there, but I see that they have traveled to a different location. We do that sometimes if you're driving home. It's not always connected to trauma, but a lot of times association is. Often you see avoidance of people, places, triggers, things that remind them of the trauma. It could be a smell. It could be a certain cologne. It could be a certain flower, a type of house that people, oh, I can't drive by there. I can't go by there. I can't do that. Those avoidance behaviors. Often there's so much anger. When I do my sexual trauma um, groups every week, the anger is so palpable in there, but that's not something you necessarily want to take away from people right away. That anger has a message for them, which you see in high degrees of anger. There's often a lot of trust issues. Trauma happens in relationships often, relationships with people. Trust gets damaged in trauma. You often see some self-harm behaviors too. It can come in the form of addiction, like I said, but it's also cutting. It's also burning pulling hair out, all kinds of different self-harming kinds of things. Um, disordered eating, not just eating disorders, but different types of disordered eating. Um, negative 
views of the world. That's another hallmark of PTSD, the avoidance and the negative views of the world, themselves or other people. They often think other people are terrible or they're very, very suspicious. So what does he want? Why would he be nice to me? What's the other thing? What's the other motive back there? Often we also see a lot of somatic complaints in people with trauma. In mental health, we call those we call these body complaints somatic complaints. So they may have a lot of back aches. My head always hurts. I'm just tired all the time. My gut is not right. If you've read that book, The Body Keeps the Score, it'll tell you a lot more about those somatic complaints. So they'll have medicalizing issues a lot. There's a strong tendency to want to get away from people, to isolate, to give away, to be alone. They feel like they can control things better if they are by themselves. High anxiety very much on edge, closed off people, easily aggravated. And we often see this need to always carry a weapon, that need to always feel like they are protected or that they will not ever be a victim again. Um, people who have a lot of trauma, especially people with PTSD, carry a great deal of shame and guilt. Whatever the traumatic experience may be, a lot of times our brains try to figure out how it's our fault. I should have gone left when I went right. I should have told him when he said yes, I should have not gone. I should have told someone when this happened. They deal with so much shame and guilt. And then as you all know, the legal issues that come along, I'd say 70 to 80% of the veterans I work with, I get them after a lot of legal involvement. It's rare that I get them before the legal involvement. It's almost always that we're getting calls from jail or parents have called that their son is in a lot of legal issues, but they know he has PTSD. So we're constantly getting people straight from jail for that treatment because the PTSD is there. It's caused some of these other behaviors, whether it's DUIs, domestic violence, the weapons charges, child abuse. We often see a lot of legal issues in this arena as well. So what happens with trauma and cognition and memory is when somebody's experiencing a traumatic event, like I said, a lot of times their brain or their mind will dissociate and go to another place. But what happens when that's going on is the brain doesn't store the memory very well. It stores it in a splintered kind of place. The brain's prefrontal cortex, which is the key to decision making and memory, often becomes temporarily impaired. And that amygdala, known to encode the emotional experiences, begins to dominate. It triggers the release of the stress hormones and helps to record fragments of sensory information. Information, the sensation of being frozen in place can happen, that dissociative state. Trauma often has a negative impact on rational behavior responses. People don't always act rationally after trauma. They may not do what you think they should have done in that situation. And like I said, the storage of the memory may be disorganized or fragmented or splintered so that they can keep going. If I had the whole full memory there, it might just collapse me mentally. So the brain knows that. It's going to store it in fragments. So often the person who's experienced trauma will tell you things that seem chronologically out of order or seem it just something seems off about this because the memory has been splintered. So that's one of the things that the therapies that we do with people helps them get the total memory formed back in one place and then hopefully put it in a place in her brain that's less disturbing. So seemingly normal events in the present day can reactivate the person's trauma and response. The body remembers. I may not be experiencing trauma right now, but that guy looks like the guy who raped me. And so my nervous system has gone out the roof. Even though that's not him, it still reminds me in my body and my nervous system remembers and will get reactivated. So when we talk about trauma informed, what does that mean? We just talked about what trauma was. So what does it mean when we talk about trauma informed? It's a strength based framework. You know, in social workers, we come from a strength based, not a problem based perspective. And it's grounded in that understanding of responsiveness to the impact of trauma. It emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety, both for the survivors and for us. And it creates opportunities for survivors to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. Like I said, trauma happens in relationships, but it's also healed 
in relationships. Positive relationships can go a long way in the healing process. When we talk about trauma-informed care, we realize the widespread impact of trauma. And we understand that there's a lot of different paths to recovery. It's not just one way that people recover. Trauma-informed care also means we recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients. That you all, after I gave you that list, hopefully you'll be a little bit more aware of some things. This is just kind of a surface level thing. But you have to know some of those things to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in our clients, our families, their families, our families, and also the staff we work with, the others involved in the systems we work in. This is a pretty traumatizing job at the end of the day. Some of the stories that we listen to can be really difficult. So if you can see some of your coworkers or someone that you work with being overwhelmed with some of the traumatic um, information that they've been exposed to, We'll talk about that in a little bit too. So the trauma-informed care, we also respond by fully integrating the knowledge about trauma into our policies, procedures, and practices. And the most important thing, you'll probably get tired of hearing me say this, is we're seeking to actively resist re-traumatizing the people. Our system is not built for that. The system is built in some ways to re-traumatize people, but we as individuals, we know this, and we are working to actively resist that re-traumatization. So when we talk about trauma-informed lawyer, lawyering or being a trauma-informed attorney, the trauma-informed legal practice aims to reduce free traumatization and recognize the role trauma plays in the relationship that you're going to have with your client. That it's a third party in the room in some ways. So integrating some of these practices will provide you with the opportunity to increase costs. Increase connections to clients and improve advocacy for these folks. They need our voices. So when we talk about working with survivors of intimate partner violence or domestic violence or trauma-informed care, there's a few things that we want to make sure that we have. We want to be able to collaborate with them. Even though we are the ones who've been to school, we are the professionals in the room a lot of times, we want to make this a collaborative process and less about me up here with the power and you down here without the power, we want to try to make it collaborative as much as possible. And we want to emphasize that they're safe with us. We aren't going to abuse the power that we have. We're not going to abuse our relationship with them, that we are a safe person. And we do that by giving them choice, offering them options, showing them that they have some control in this place because so often, in the midst of the trauma, they had no control, they had no agency, no independence, no voice. We want to make sure that we are allowing them to have that space when they're with us. So the experience that domestic violence and intimate partner violence, that experience violates a person's physical safety and security. So programs need to provide the same physical spaces for both adults and the children who survive those experiences. So when we talk about trauma-informed, what does that mean? How do we do it? It means that we're looking at a person and not asking what's wrong with you or asking what happened to you. Excuse me, about 20 years ago in mental health, that, that question changed. It used to be, what's wrong with you? What, what's the problem here? Now we've moved over to a question of what's happened to you? What's your experiences? asking more informed questions. So when we're talking to clients, you may think that they've been to court, that they know this process. Even if you think that, we still want to preview with them what to expect. We want to let them know what's going to happen. I'm going to have to talk to you about the experience that you had with your husband last night. Are you in a place that we can do that today? We want to ask. We want to ask for permission. We want to let them know what's going to happen. Let them know as much as you can what to expect. Allow them to lead the conversation when possible. Well, why don't you start? You go ahead and, and just begin where you'd like to start here with us. And check in. Are you okay? Does this seem like it's going all right? Do you need a break? Would you like to step out for a second and gather yourself? You want to check in. Notice the obvious. Is there crying and breaking down? Acknowledge that. This seems like it's really tough. I can tell this is really difficult for you. Offer input. If there's offer notice and input, if changes need to be made. Hey, it looks like we're going to have to reschedule this date. I'm looking towards October. Is there any date that won't work? 
ask, just ask, even if there's not a hundred percent possibility that you're going to be able to work with them, try to give them some agency or some voice in there. If you can record and take notes to avoid asking the same questions over and over and over. If you can, please avoid that. I don't want to have to tell my traumatic experience to 14 people. Please try to get that to as few people as possible. If you're interviewing children, please try to use one of the children's advocacy centers. Like I said, even if they've been to court, you want to help them understand the process and what to expect. Don't assume that they know, even if they've been there before, if their nerves or anxiety, if the trauma's there, help them understand what to expect and what's going to happen. So when you're talking about trauma-informed care, some considerations, again, like before, are giving seating options that aren't everybody's back to the door here. This would be terrible for people with PTSD, all your backs to the door. They would hate it. They want to be able to see what is coming for me. I need to be ready because I want to see what's about to come in. So if all of your seating is the back to the door, maybe offer one option where the seat is not to the back to the door. Like I mentioned before, asking permission, giving choices. Do we need to take a break? Are you feeling up to this today? And making sure those entrances and exits are well lit. I can't tell you how many times women have told me, well, I was going to go into that office, but I just drove by and there's a bunch of guys sitting out front and I just couldn't go in. I wasn't going to stop. Give consideration. I know we can't bust people off the sidewalk, but if you've got a lot of people hanging out, smoking out front of the building, People with trauma, PTSD, they're going to be very cautious about coming into situations like that. And you want to notice your proximity. People have a pretty big bubble who've experienced PTSD and trauma. You don't want to get too close. You definitely don't ever want to touch them without asking. But you also want to notice your proximity, how close you are, um, how that might activate somebody's nervous system if you get too close. And I'll say this a couple of times too. Please don't aggravate get too mad at me but please have above board boundaries with these folks no personal gifts no personal phone calls we're probably not friends on social media no extras um it's gonna it's it's just gonna go left a lot of times they're gonna take it the wrong way they're gonna feel uncomfortable it's gonna get um, misconstrued at times so it's very very important that the boundaries are clear and safe for these folks who've experienced trauma and so assume also that information is probably going to be need, needed to be repeated from time to time. Survivors of trauma and loss may have difficulty retaining and processing information. It's a common complaint I hear from veterans is my memory is really bad. My concentration is really difficult for me to pay attention for long periods of time. So just understand you probably are going to have to repeat things. And even offering it in a verbal form and a written form too might be an option. So as trauma-informed individuals, we understand and accept that people are the sum of their lived experiences, good, bad, ugly, just like me and you, not the charges or the problems that they're there. They're not, we don't want to oversimplify and reduce them down just to what's happened to them or the things that they're in trouble for or what they've done. They're full people. They've had full lives. They've had full experiences. We want to recognize them for the whole people that they are. As trauma-informed individuals, we offer transparency. We say what we mean, we mean what we say. We are not doing things in the dark behind their back. That's, that's going to cause some issues for people who experience trauma. We want to be as transparent as possible. Having that non-judgmental attitude, we can. I know it's hard if you're judged not to be judgmental, but we want to try to come from that place of we're not judging you on what your experience was. We're here to actually help and be a, a confidant for you. So being trustworthy too, like I mentioned, saying what you mean and meaning what you say, not promising things that you can't deliver. That's a big one. So honesty, consistency, again with the boundaries, and acknowledging those discomforts when you see them, acknowledging the obvious that's going on. And really, when we're talking about trauma-informed individuals, it actually starts from the top. You and I can be trauma informed in our work, but if we work for an agency that's not, or we have bosses that could care less, it makes it more difficult. So it's really a top to bottom approach. It's the people who answer your phones, it's the people who um, do your legal secretary work, it's the people who um, do any kind of other 
um, ancillary jobs for you, that they also have an awareness that we deal with a lot of people who've experienced trauma. So we want to make sure that we're treating them with care and respect when we deal with them. So how we support that is we understand that tra traumatic stress is huge. It's it's major. We just went through a huge pandemic too. I can't tell you if you, you probably already know this the mental health system is busting at the seams you'll already probably know every therapist is booked out for months we were already short mental health practitioners before the pandemic now we're dealing with so much grief it, it it's just unimaginable the amount of people that are needing help right now and so just understanding how much trauma is out there and how it impacts people it means that we recognize that many behaviors and responses that may seem ineffective and unhealthy in this present moment probably were adaptive responses to past traumatic experiences. It's like my vets when they come in, they have you know long-standing substance abuse problems. Like it or not, that crack helped them get through the terrible times that they had. It was not the best coping skill, but it was a coping skill. It helped them get to this point to me. So now we can learn some more things. So even though it may seem maladaptive to you, it probably had a reason for being there in the first place. We always want to promote safety, establishing, like I said, that safe physical space, making that a safe emotionally and physically environment safety measures are in place provider responses are consistent respectful and we want to ensure that our have cultural competence that different people experience trauma and re uh, relationships in different ways culturally that culture also influences one's perception and response to traumatic events and the recovery process. I had one um, Korean family in my 20 year career, and it was very enlightening and very interesting. And the way that they handled trauma was very different than the Caucasian families I've worked with. So understanding that it may not seem like something you understand, but from that cultural space, it makes perfect sense to them. And again, we support client control, choice, and autonomy. It's so important that we allow our clients to have that sense of control over their lives, that they can build competencies that's going to strengthen that sense of autonomy for them. Like we do that again, like I said, I keep in more informed about the processes, what to expect, what's happening. And as I mentioned before, understanding that healing happens in relationships, it may seem minor, but you may be the most kind, respectful person that they're going to encounter that day, that week, that month. It may be huge just that you've offered that kind space to them. It probably is going to go a lot further than you realize. We had these vets come to the VA in North Little Rock one day, and they were from a program called the Human Hug Project. I've never heard of them, but they told their story and they were both suicidal vets who had had really difficult combat, multiple combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they had been trying to find themselves. And now they go around to different VAs and they hold these signs up that says free hugs. And they go and they hug everybody and hug all of us. And it was, it was cool, but one of them said he was sitting at the VA one day, very depressed, just sitting there waiting to go to his appointment. And the nurse walked by. She came back. You look like you need a hug, son. And he said he just busted out crying. And that was so huge to him. He said, I had walked around being and feeling invisible to the world. That if I left, no one would care. No one would notice if I was here anymore. That one person noticing him in that moment was life-changing. Life-changing for him. So you may be that person to them that notices something about them that they need this they need understanding they need respect they need compassion in that moment so just understand that healing does happen in relationships and those relationships can be with us most importantly too we want to remember for our clients that recovery is possible i had a guy that came in not that long ago he said he'd been in our sub program 27 times yeah, you can come to your set program as many times as you want. You can do our 45-day program over and over again. You can do it 27 times. We said, Miss Sutherland, I'm clean. I've been clean for three years. I know everybody got tired of seeing me up here, but he did it. It was 
27 times, the 27, 20, whatever time, 28 time was the key. He did it. Never give up on people. Remember that recovery is possible. It's possible for everyone. We really don't write anybody off anymore, regardless of how vulnerable they may seem to us. We want to instill hope by providing opportunities for our clients to be involved in, the, in as many levels of the system in a positive way we can. If we've got peer support on board, that would be wonderful. I know that's hard to find a lot of times, but there are a lot of peer support recovery specialists out there that can help. So some things I want to just remind you, as we finish this piece, is about trauma is pervasive. It is all over. Most people in this world have experienced some form of trauma. Some surveys say between 55 and 90 percent of us have experienced at least one traumatic event. I'm finding it hard to believe how it's not 100, but we know it's a lot of folks that have experienced trauma. So just know that it's pervasive. When I work in hospitals, we do uh, always do a huge, huge orientation around infection control. And they say, assume everybody's infected until you know otherwise. This was even before COVID. So we want to assume that most people have experienced trauma until we found out otherwise. I also want you to remember that the impact of trauma is very broad. And it touches many life domains, parenting, all kinds of relationships jobs, families, substance use, all domains of our lives can be affected by trauma. And we also want to remind you too that violent trauma is often self-perpetuating. Individuals who are victims of violence can be at an increased risk of becoming perpetrators at some point. Not always, we know, but there is an increased risk. So understanding that without treatment, that we can, this can be perpetuating. We need to get people help into recovery as much as possible. Trauma is insidious. It preys, it preys particularly on the more vulnerable among us, right? If they've already had some of those ACEs, they've already had some difficulties in life, or we're vulnerable to more trauma. If a client has a one sexual assault, they're vulnerable to an additional sexual assault. It's, they're vulnerable after experiencing trauma. And then trauma affects the way people approach helping relationships. Like I said, people who've experienced trauma are often very suspicious, very suspicious. I can't tell you how many times clients have told me, well, I saw the uh, public pretender over there talking to the prosecutor, and I know their buddies, so they all work. They get paid whether I go to jail or not. They're always suspicious. They're always thinking there's some alternative motive. So understanding that they're often suspicious of helping relationships. People don't always follow through with resources and human services because of that suspicion, because of that fear of what will happen. I have a client in my private practice who was experiencing a tremendous amount of domestic violence. She was getting beaten and threatened and sexually assaulted, and it was horrific. Begged her to get help and begged her to get help, going to get um, restraining orders and all these things. And she said, I'm scared they're going to take my son away. I can't get it. She was so afraid that if she went and told somebody besides me what was happening, the DHS was going to take her son away. I was like, you're not being a bad mom because you're in domestic violence. That's not the case. I can't guarantee that the DHS won't come and ask you questions when this all comes out, but that's not the focus that they're worried about. The focus is trying to get you to safety. That you can see how these systems make it difficult for people to trust at times. So I want to switch gears just a little bit. Things, or staying trauma informed. Remember what happened to you instead of what did you do? You guys, as you continue going to be staying trauma informed, take more of these kind of continuing education hours. Read books and articles that pertain to trauma, brain health, and brain development. I've got three here that are really good. The Boy Who's Raised as a Dog, 
the bites, the score, waking the tiger, what happened to you. Those are three really awesome, good, easy books to read about trauma. And then becoming culturally competent. The way a survivor experiences traumatic reactions will be affected by the culture in which they live, in which they belong. So understanding the different aspects of culture. And as you can continue to grow in this area, you develop an office culture that supports people taking time off for their mental health. So we all understand what's going on in this job and we need to be able to have some time off. So if you have a client that experience, expresses to you a history of trauma or have current concerning behaviors, please try to refer them to a mental health professional. Even though I just told you we're all booked out and we're stuck, still we got to do something. We got to get them connected to the help. If they don't have insurance, look for those community mental health centers, the CAM. CMHCs all have grant money that they're supposed to be using to help people that don't have insurance. Most even have mobile assessors that will visit jails. Do what you can to connect them to the limited resources we have. Also, I just put this in here. You all probably know this, but never leave a suicidal or homicidal person alone. Consider calling one of the psychiatric hospitals, request admission, ask if they have a mobile assessor or someone who can come assess somebody for admission. Things they're looking for if you call them, or does the person have insurance? Or are they currently homicidal, suicidal with a plan, intent, or they're so gravely disorganized that they can't make safe decisions for themselves? Those are kind of the admission criteria. But we do have a couple of resources here in Arkansas. The, we've got a mental health and addiction line. I called up this week just to make sure it was still operative because I hadn't called it since the beginning of COVID, and it still is. So you can call this number here, 1-844-763-0198. Somebody will answer the phone. They'll ask you what's going on. They'll ask you if you've got insurance. It's okay if you don't. And they'll try to connect you to a provider near you that can give you some help. So I'm so thankful that Arkansas does that. We have another great resource through UMS called Art Connects. If you're not familiar with that one, it is a great resource that the UMS and our Connect is providing comprehensive behavioral health treatment programs um, for all Arkansans, from mental health issues, substance abuse disorders, all kinds of things. So there's a call center and a virtual clinic. They do a lot of telehealth. So this is very helpful for people in our rural communities who can't maybe drive to a therapist's office or who don't have transportation or have mobility issues that our Connect can do some telehealth. That, that number is answered 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's a really awesome resource. And so I wanna just talk a little bit about what we experience as helping people. A lot of times you'll hear it as burnout, compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma. And so what it is, is we get vicarious trauma because we're experiencing some of the things that they're experiencing as they're telling us these things. It can be very, very um, difficult to be able to sustain this kind of work for long. So secondary traumatic stress is defined as the natural consequent behaviors and emotions resulting from knowing about a traumatizing event experienced by another. The stress resulting from helping or wanting to help traumatized or suffering people. You're all here because you have a heart for this. It affects us, especially when you're being trauma informed. It's more intentional, it's on purpose. And so it takes that mindful being in the moment with the person. It's more emotionally draining than just phoning it in. So this is the occupational challenge that we have working with people in this field. Um, it's, it can be very difficult to sustain this kind of work for very long, as you all have probably seen. I just did a, a session on compassion fatigue for um, students at the law school in Little Rock. Um, and just looking at a compassion fatigue attorney, it's thousands and thousands of articles that come up, right, about the, the difficulties that attorneys have with staying in the field for long periods of time due to the work that you do. And so we know that this can affect us. So there is a cost to caring. Professionals who listen to clients' stories of pain and suffering may feel similar fear, pain, and suffering because they care. Sometimes we feel we're losing our own sense of self to the clients we serve. 
there is a cost of this kind of caring relationship that we're in with our, our clients. So there's some risk factors that make some people more vulnerable to having secondary trauma. If you're working with survivors of trauma and violence, you're at risk of being negatively impacted, all, um, obviously. But if you yourself have a prior traumatic experience, if you look at that ACEs study and you look at those 10 questions and you come up with a six, eight, nine, you have a high vulnerability to be at risk for additional traumatic experiences happening to you. If you are a person that tends to socially isolate off and on the job, you're a loner, you are more vulnerable to experiencing secondary trauma. If you're a person who has a tendency to avoid your feelings, withdraw from situations, even assign blame to others and stressful events, you could be more vulnerable. Have people who have difficulty expressing feelings, those who have difficulty asking for help, um, people who have a lack of preparation, orientation, training, and support, and supervision in their jobs. I can't tell you how many times people have told me that. Why well, didn't we get trained for this? I don't have any support. There's no one here to help puts you more at risk for having that secondary trauma. If you're a newer employee and you have less experience at your job, more at risk for trauma. I think it was, I see, I'm trying to remember some of the uh, literature I read that, that um, burnout usually happens or passion fatigue happens within the first five years. You think that it's longer you've been in the profession, it's really not. It's people who get in there, go hard and flash out quickly. That constant and intense exposure to trauma with little or no variation in work tasks. That's why I love coming here. I'm talking about trauma, but I'm not sitting in a room listening to somebody talk about a gang rape all day. This is so much better. I get to do a variety of different things. You have to have some variety. If you have one constant thing and you only do domestic violence cases, you need to sort of break it up with something every once in a while. Volunteer at a at a shelter, go to a boys club, do something different to break up that work that you're doing. And if you have a lack of effective and supportive process for discussing the traumatic content of the work, you got to have some way to offload these things that you're dealing with. If you just keep it and collect it, it's going to accumulate in you. It's going to be really heavy. You're going to have to set it down at some point. So when we deal with compassion fatigue, things that we're looking for, Four are, when we talk about compassion fatigue, it refers to that deep and emotional, physical wearing down that takes place with us. Between 40 and 85% of helping professionals develop that compassion fatigue because of this work that we do and it, the level of trauma and the lack of resources both together affect, affect that. So what are the symptoms? What are you going to notice if you're having compassion fatigue? You're going to feel overwhelmed physically and emotionally. You're going to be really exhausted and it's not going to be a sleep that's going to help. You go home and sleep for 12 hours, you're going to wake up and still be exhausted mentally and physically. It's not something that sleep is probably going to help. If you have client work demands regularly encroach on your personal time. I do a lot of clients through JLab. I had no idea before I started working with client, uh, lawyers that a lot of you are on call. The people answer their phone 24 7. I didn't know that that was an expectation for attorneys until I started working more with lawyers that many of them carry a phone and they're answering it at 10 o'clock at night. I couldn't believe that some people had that expectation and that they weren't really going to have a, a, a home time. And so that's going to be really important, that boundaries here, right, that, that we notice when, when work starts encroaching on our personal time. I had a, went to a trauma uh, CEU event where a lady who had started a rape sexual assault program in Denver, and she said she realized that things had become overwhelming for her when she was at the top of the mountain and she was getting ready to ski down, but she started being worried that someone was going to attack her from the back. And so she realized work is starting to affect me. I'm, I'm starting to have the same symptoms of the clients that I work with. Um, when we start having pessimistic, cynical, irritable, and prone to anger kind of behavior, negative views of coworkers, clients in the profession. I've seen that at my job. Y'all probably have too. I think I've got another one of these coming in. Oh, I'm so tired of these kids forever. They start to not like the people that they're working with and for. 
seem to have a real hard to is they can get irritated at the people who are coming to them for help. Um, becoming emotionally detached and numb in their professional and personal life. That in order to get through this job, you've numbed your feelings. You don't feel anything. You're just here. That's probably a sign of some compassion fatigue. If you notice yourself withdrawing socially and becoming emotionally disconnected from others, questioning your professional competence and effectiveness, like, am I even good at this? Am I helping people? Is what I'm doing does, does it even matter? If you start to secretly self medicate, if you're drinking at the job, that's a bad sign, everybody. If you're watching porn at work, it's probably a bad sign, right? You're looking for ways to check out. Come back and consider what's going on. It can be any kind of secretive kind of behaviors, alcohol, drugs, sex, food, gambling. If you're keeping it a secret from somebody, it might be a problem. And when we become less productive and effective, I've had people say that a lot. I noticed that the productivity fell way off. They were still coming to work, but they just couldn't get it in gear. You have sleep disturbances, fatigue, or loss of appetite, or just the disillusionment of career. Why am I doing this? I cannot believe I chose this job. What was I thinking? Why am I here? I can't even believe this. So attorneys have a lot of compassion fatigue, as you all probably know. From the ABA, it says lawyers, like others in the health and professions, are at risk for experiencing compassion fatigue, especially lawyers in certain practice areas, such as criminal, family, juvenile law, Domestic violence cases, obviously, may be especially susceptible to compassion fatigue because they're regularly exposed to those human-induced traumas, and then we're called to empathically listen to people tell us these terrible, terrible stories. Read reports, read descriptions of traumatic events, view crime, accident scene photos, graphic evidence of traumatic victimizations. Those with very high caseloads and those with a high high capacity for empathy are also at risk for compassion fatigue. And so how we do that, what do we do with this? How do we control this compassion fatigue? Come on, um, okay, that's great. So we want to connect back to the why. Why did you choose this job? Why did you choose this field? You're going to have to know your why because we're going to need you to connect back to that a lot when you're feeling tired and feeling overwhelmed by this job, you're going to have to remember why you started this, why you wanted to do this in the first place. And also, it's going to help to be able to name and accept your feelings. Don't ignore it. I'm feeling really sad about that situation that we had last week with the mother and the son. And I was so devastated that court turned out like that. Being able to name it and even accept your feelings goes a long way. One thing that I've had to do, and you all may have to do this too, but I have to accept that the job changed me in ways that I didn't expect and couldn't foresee. We all know child abuse happens, but until you see the child, you hear the story, and you read the report, you can't deny the details. That innocence that you had is gone. You now know the details, the graphic ways that these things happen to people. So you just may need to accept that this job has changed you in ways that you didn't foresee. Connect with other people at work if you can. Have a decompression, buddy. We need to go out for lunch. I got to tell you about this situation. Or can you go out for happy hour later tonight? Because I've got a bad situation. I need to just process with somebody. I have one coworker that I can do that with. I have another coworker who says, ah, I can't hear it. I can't. I got too much. Not today. But take breaks. Nobody hears a Superman. If you know you've had a particularly difficult client to a case or a day, build in some downtime. That day, I gotta go for a bike ride tonight. I've gotta make sure that I do my book reading tonight. I've got to make sure that I have some downtime. Rituals and consistency can bring can bring peace to us. It can be small things like making your bed, having coffee on the deck in the morning, listening to a podcast on the way home. But those rituals and consistency can bring peace to us when we're dealing with these heavy topics. And you want to make a clear distinction between home and work. I know some people are working from home, or you're you're living at work, whatever you want to call it, but you still got to set boundaries. Have work clothes, home clothes, work time, home time. Set those boundaries and stick with them. This is something I learned early in my career, and I have to come back to it constantly. Remind yourself you're responsible to these folks. You are not responsible for them. They're going to make choices, decisions, and things that you have no control over. 
That is not yours to own. The little girl don't want to give it to you and put it all in your lap and give it away. Of course, it's not yours. Don't take it. You're responsible to be professional, ethical, respectful to them. You are not responsible for the outcome or the consequences they face. And importantly, have a varied life outside of work, hobbies, social connection, pets, curiosities. Don't make work your entire life. There's a big important Harvard research study about income and happiness, and it tops out at a certain level. I think it's around 130,000. So people who make over that are not happier than the rest of us. And finally, reach out for help if it becomes overwhelming. JLAP is a great resource for judges, laws, and lawyers, attorneys, and students. Ask for help. Nobody has to do this on their own. Ask someone for help. Anybody have questions? Okay. Any questions? Well, I appreciate you all. Hey, uh, thanks for sticking around. We, uh, as I said earlier, when we first started, federal court doesn't lend itself really to helping or addressing issues of domestic violence. We do have, there are a couple of things that are um, um, pertinent in federal court that deal with domestic violence, either victims or perpetrators for that matter. Um, Ashley mentioned one a moment ago. Uh, uh, it's a felony in federal under federal criminal law if you are under a protective order or an order of protection and you possess a firearm. A lot of people don't know that. You can get 10 years in prison for that um, if the government decides to prosecute it. So we're going to talk about that and, and, and probably the more important issue we're going to talk about from a perspective of the Power Act and, and what we're trying to deal with today is detention issues. And that's a, that's a place where pre-trial a person is in custody, has been arrested, and they are looking at either getting a bond and being released pending a criminal trial, or uh, they're looking at being detained without bond pending a, a criminal trial. And probably more than any other area, at least that I have dealt with, uh, the detention or release question can have, and these, these folks here can tell you, can have issues with domestic violence fairly routinely in one way or another. And that's really one of the only sort of areas where federal court has direct impact or direct input on the issue that we're talking about. And today we have this panel here, a great panel to talk about this issue. Just let me briefly introduce and have Ms. Amanda Jordan in the red uh, sweater jacket. Amanda is a supervisory United States probation officer in the Western District of Arkansas. Uh, next to her is Travis Morrissey, who is a private lawyer uh, who his office in Hot Springs. He practices in federal court a lot. He practices in federal criminal court a lot. He's in my court all the time. Don't always do what he wants, uh, <laughs> but he's there a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And, uh, and then and next we have Ms. Kim Harris, who is um, an assistant United States attorney in the Western District of Arkansas. She's actually, I think, still the deputy criminal chief. So, I can. so she's the deputy criminal chief over the criminal division. Uh, one of her kind of claims to fame is uh, she is professionally, not personally, but professionally, the boss of her husband, uh, who also <laughs> works in the uh, in the uh, So she, she's got that going for her. And then last but certainly not least, we have the federal defender for the uh, Western District of Arkansas, uh, Bruce Eddy. And Mr. Eddy has worked defending uh, pro bono people, uh, for the most part, in federal court for I hate to say it, but going on 24 years, 25 years, 25, 25 years, yeah, since 1997, 1998. And so all of these guys deal with the issues that, that we're talking about here. Uh, detention in federal court is governed by federal criminal statutes. It's Title 18, United States Code, Section 3142, and particularly Section 3142G deals with the themes of court the judge has to consider when making an issue regarding detention or release. So we're going to do this as a panel discussion. If you have a question, please speak up and we'll try to answer as we go along. Uh, what I want to do first is ask each of these guys just come sort of separately to sort of tell what they do in preparation for 
paying attention here. And I'm gonna start with Amanda because Amanda actually is not a litigant. She's not she's not a partisan in these hearings. She works for the court. And the probation officer's job in these hearings, these detention hearings, is to gather information and present that to the court. Now the parties get to hear that information as well and get to see it, but it first comes to the court. And one of the things that Amanda and the people that work for her have to do is go out and interview family members, interview defendants, talk to them on the phone, go to their houses, those sorts of things. So Amanda, if you would just start us off by just kind of giving a kind of an overview of what your officers do when someone gets arrested or is looking at having a bond hearing or detention hearing in federal court. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, COVID kind of put a monkey wrench into our system. Um, before, we would always go to the jail, conduct an interview if the person was in custody. Uh, now, a lot of times it's virtual. We might call on the phone. We might uh, uh, do it via Zoom. But basically what we're doing is we're gathering information. And this is voluntary. This person, the defendant, does not have to talk to us. Uh, we go over a form with them that says that we're not going to discuss the charge because they've not been convicted. They are simply, they've been charged in federal court. So we let them know it's their right to talk to us because we are just gathering information on their ties to the community, their uh, employment, uh, their where they live, how long they've lived there, uh, their financial situation, uh, of course, their mental health history, substance abuse history, if they want to talk about that, um, and things of that nature. We don't really discuss the charge. Um, another thing we do that's pretty important to the bond report is uh, we gather criminal history because this person may already be on a uh, some type of supervision, whether it be state court, maybe federal court. So we gather that information to see if they are they've been in compliance, if they have a probation officer, uh, and they may not have criminal history. This may be the first time they've ever been in the, in the system. Um, and of course, we talk to uh, family if if that person want. Sometimes they don't want us to talk to their family. Um, but most of the time we tell them, you know, the purpose of this is so that the judge can determine whether you get a bond, if you're released, or if you stay in jail. Um, so usually they're pretty forthcoming with us. Um, if they're not, we reach out to whoever's representing them, and they might, you know, sit in on the interview with us. But uh, we contact families, see if they are willing to assist this person. If they are placed on bond, maybe they might be what we call a third-party custodian. They might report any violations to us or the court. Um, and then we also, we call it a pretrial risk assessment. It puts this person in one of five categories that kind of just, it's a risk predictor of how well they'll do on showing up to court. Because we're really trying to determine two things for the court. Um, risk of appearance or non-appearance, which basically means, will this person show back up to see Judge Bryant or whoever it is in federal court? And then the second thing is risk of danger to a specific person or the community. And of course, in domestic violence cases, the threat to a person is, is pretty prevalent. We know what it is. They may have an order of protection against someone. Uh, the community is a little bit more vague. It means like this person was trafficking drugs. Of course, the risk of danger to the community is to continue that criminal behavior. If, it, or if it's a financial charge, we don't want them committing or allegedly committing the same offense in the community. So uh, we we kind of set forth these risk factors based off our interview with this person and our investigation. And we submit a recommendation on whether we think we can suggest conditions that might mitigate those risks that we've identified, whether we think this person is suitable for release or detention. Um, and we prepare all this in a report and we give this to the parties and to the judge. And then we are present in court if we need to um, address any of these issues we found uh, or if there's any questions about what we discovered during our investigation. But that's that's basically what pretrial services would do to prepare for the detention hearing. Thanks, Amanda. Travis, what about you? I mean, you get appointed regularly on uh, cases where the defendant's been charged with some sort of violation of of a crime, and you generally, the first thing you do is you have, a, you have an initial appearance in court where the person's informed of the charge and given the lawyer if they don't have one. And then the next thing that happens is almost always is a detention hearing. When you get appointed, what do you do in general terms uh, to prepare for a uh, detention hearing? Well, typically when I get appointed, it's um, very short order. Like sometimes it'll be a Thursday or a 10 o'clock Zoom on Friday and where I have to glean all the information I can quickly. 
Um, but as Judge Bryant said, usually the most important thing to the defendant is whether they're going home or going to stay in jail for some prolonged period of time, whether case works through the system. Um, and so kind of like the, um, the, the statute that we're talking about here is set up. Usually when I first get the case, I reach out to probation and we talk and I can figure out it's either one. Likely the defendant's not going to get any bond under any circumstances whatsoever, maybe a ice hold or a detainer or something, or they just have uh, such a history or penalties in their past that there's, uh, as Amanda said, not a likelihood of their appearance in court or something like that. So usually I try to figure out if I'm going to be, sadly, against probation or with probation. Occasionally, uh, probation comes to me and they say, we want them to be released, but we need some help. And it may be um, kind of like a suitable location or a suitable supervisor. So usually I'm trying to figure out um, under those factors that are set forth in there. And, and I would say, it's like Judge Bryant said, I ask a lot, I get rejected a lot, but I try to come up with a plan that, that works in my head, even if it may not work for the judge, where, where there's at least a plan for a supervisor, uh, an individual where I can at least maybe create a pathway that if everything else is clear that they can get out. Um, so that's, and I will often say, even when we're antagonistic, every U.S. probation officer I work with, they're very candid. They usually tell me what the problem is. And so um, a lot of times when it's those difficult cases, I work on the, the conditions or combination of conditions. Uh, old days, it used to be GPS monitors or that sort of thing to see if there's something, because obviously it makes my job easier, especially in the older days before Zoom, if I didn't have to go to, you know, Washita County and lose a whole day to go show them discovery and I can do it via Zoom or if they're out, especially if it's a Hot Springs Division case, if they're, if they're near me and I know the judge would always allow them to come see their lawyer as part of their, their conditions of release. But um, that's usually what I try and do. And it's usually in a 24 hour period or 48 hour. I usually don't have a lot of lean time. So. Kim, from the other side of the coin, how does the government approach detention? I mean, I, how, what things do you look at to, to make a decision without regard to the legal presumption stuff out there? But what other kind of practical factors go into the government's decision on seeking detention or not? Bruce is laughing. Okay. <laughs> Let me just say that. I've got my pen out right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a threat. Um, these, these are the secrets I've always wanted to know. I would just say that every case is different for me and for um, the AUSAs that practice. Um, every case is different. And as Travis said, these things happen really fast. Under the statute, there's at maximum a three-day continuance for me, for the government's attorney, and a five-day continuance for the defense if they ask it. And the, I think the idea under the statute is that when they come to court on this first appearance, they might have their detention hearing. It doesn't really happen that way. I, in most cases that I've experienced, the hearing is a few days later to give the parties a chance to really address the factors in the statute. Um, and so what I do and what we do from the government side is we've obviously brought the charge um, and it's either filed in the indictment or it's filed in, on a criminal complaint. And so we are going to work quickly to get a case agent or a detective ready uh, to testify and tell the court about um, the nature of the offense and what exactly happened in this case. What, what are the facts that brought forth this charge um, that's before the court? Uh, and the other things that we're going to look at, aside from just the actual charge itself, is what is probation recommending in this case? And most oftentimes, we will agree with probation's recommendation. It's um, not um, often that we go against what probation is recommending. But I think to just piggyback on what Travis said, everybody in the process, while it is adversarial, is very professional and very respectful of one another. And so while we disagree on why, you know, why does the government's attorney think this person needs to stay detained pending further proceedings, and probation may think, well, why are, you know, it's a very good dialogue that we have with each other and very respectful. Um, and the things, I don't, I don't know if I'm going, no, go ahead. But, um, the things that I, I look at on my cases, definitely the presumption that we're not really talking about right now, but also the criminal history and someone's prior response to the judicial system. Have they uh, failed to appear before? Have they uh, been held in contempt before? And then aside from just their response to the judicial process, what types of things have they done? Have they been convicted of domestic battery? Have they been convicted of aggravated assault? 
or aggravated assault on a family or household member? Have they had a cruelty to animals conviction or endangering the welfare of a minor? Those types of things definitely will stand out or a sexual abuse conviction or a rape conviction, those types of things, as well as even, you know, breaking into someone's home, residential burglary. Um, and those are, that's not a definitive list. Those are just some things that would really catch my attention as I'm going through the pretrial report. Um, and the, also the defendant's response to whatever sentence was imposed. Unfortunately, a lot of times what, what we see is someone who, by the time they've made it to the federal system, there's a pattern of probation, probation revocation, probation again, revocation, or parole, parole revocation, back to the ADC, paroled out, parole revoked. And those people are, are the ones that they haven't had a positive response to the judicial system. And I, you know, I'm going to make those arguments to the court in support of my request that the person be detained because if there's failures to appear, well, that speaks to their flight risk. If they are not reporting, uh, if that's an allegation to why their parole was revoked in the past or their probation was revoked in the past, if they're not reporting, well, that shows noncompliance. And why would they respect this court if they haven't done these things in the past? Um, and so those are things that, that we look for as we get ready for these hearings. But what do they look like? Well, it usually involves the government putting on a case agent or a detective to talk about the charges and sometimes even calling a pretrial services officer to talk about the contents of the report. Um, and aside from that, I haven't ever put on any other witnesses in a detention hearing. Just thought about questions I might ask in cross-examination, which really, if believe it or not, you can sometimes have situations where you have a defendant whose third-party custodian was a victim of theirs, their proposed person they want to be released to. That's only happened a handful of times, but you start looking at the information that you have available and you're like, wait a minute, that's his mother. Well, his mother was the person who was the victim listed in this domestic battery. That's not going to work. And, and that, when we get to that point, then pretrial recognizes too, that's not most likely going to work. And, and we start, the defense attorneys will oftentimes start finding other third party custodians, but. Thank you. Bruce, I've uh, got a question for you. Bruce, yes. just to remind uh, you guys, Bruce is a federal defender. Kim's a, a prosecutor. Uh, Travis is a, is a criminal defense lawyer. But Bruce and his people, uh, his men and women in his office, all they do is represent criminal defendants in the Western District of Arkansas. Um, so in addition to the question I asked uh, these other guys about sort of your prep time, uh, let me add a little bit, see if you can and answer that is, during, during, during your prep, during your, your lawyers getting ready for these hearings or investigators, do they actually engage with family members of the defendants? And, and if so, how does that, how does that work? Uh, we do engage with family members. <clears throat> the first thing we have to do is investigate because Kim went over some of the things that she's looking at criminal history, particular types of criminal history. But we want to drill down further on that and see if they've had a failure to appear does it mean that they're not going to show up for court? Or was there something else going on? Were they unaware of that court date? So we try to go in and drill down deeper to find out something about the criminal history. And we have a luxury that probation doesn't have, and that is we can ask for time before we have our detention hearing. Probation gets their report ready. We come in for the arraignment, enter a not guilty plea, and then we can ask for a detention hearing. We can ask for a few days to, to do this. So we have the time that we can, more time than what probation has when they're trying to get that report ready. But just like on domestic violence and, and what Kim gave the example of that the mother had been uh, the victim in the domestic violence, things like that happen more common than, than you might think. But we wanna look at that even closer because on first blush you might say, that's not a good place for this person to go and be released to and stay. But to Judge Wright's question, we go and we talk to the mother. What happened? What caused this? Is it that their child, son or daughter, does okay except for when they drink? If that's a trigger that causes the problems, then the judge can order that 
no alcohol be consumed. And probation can check to make sure that they're not consuming alcohol. Another thing is how long has it been since there was a domestic violence? That, was this something that happened 10 years ago or 10 months ago? And so there's a lot of factors that go in that when you see this conviction, you don't know whether it's one that's gonna really cause the court to say, no, this person shouldn't be released because they may be a danger to their mother, they may be a danger to somebody else. So we do a lot of time investigating and trying to get the facts and trying to present the best facts to the court. Uh, if it's necessary that this person has a place to live, we will try to find who we think is a suitable third party custodian. We'll go and tell probation. And then that way they can check to see whether they agree with it or not. And if they have questions about that person, maybe we can resolve them. Maybe we look for another third party custodian, or maybe we just leave it up to Judge Bryant to make the decision whether or not the court believes this is a good third party custodian or not. But the Western District of Arkansas has had a very high pretrial detention rate over the years. It has gotten better over the last three years or so. But a lot of people are detained in the Western District of Arkansas that are not detained in other districts around the country. So we have to try to bring that to the court's attention too, to say what, what makes it different than if this person that's charged with a drug offense, if they were arrested in Little Rock and charged in federal court, and they were to get bond, why is it that they can't get bond over this imaginary line in the Western District of Arkansas? And so that's another thing that we'll look at. How often do these people that are charged with this particular type of an offense are they released on bond nationwide? And sometimes that makes a difference to the court. Sometimes it does not. But our main focus is on investigation, talking to family members. If there's been a victim to an offense, talking to the victim. A lot of times you'll find it'll be a spouse uh, that there's a that there's a either a reported uh, domestic violence, or there may be a domestic violence conviction or there's somebody may have been arrested, but it's not been adjudicated yet. And so you want to get all the background and the facts on that, when it happened, under what conditions it happened, how long ago that it was. Because only if we bring forth all of these facts to the court, can they make the best decision they can on whether the person should be released or whether they should be detained. And from a defense attorney's perspective, if you think your person is not going to do well on bond, you really try to convince them that they don't need to try to get released on bond. Because if they're released on bond, and if they don't do well, if they commit another offense, or if there's an allegation that they've committed another offense, or if they don't perform well on bond for any number of reasons, they violate some of the conditions that's been imposed, that is not going to bode well for them if they should end up being found guilty or end up pleading guilty at sentencing. So just because your client wants to be released, it may not be the best for them to be released. You have to try to sit down and talk to them. So we try to spend time with our client, get a feel for them uh, the best we can, because like Travis said, we're, we're on a short time clock, even if we've asked for a couple of days to do this. And we try to tell them, now they have a right if they want a detention hearing, even if we think it's a bad idea, we'll do the best we can and go forward on the hearing. But we'll have very honest conversations with our client. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, the detention hearing process is governed by section 3142 of the criminal code, federal criminal code. And that section has four, it, it literally specifies four different things that the court, the judge has to consider four types of things. Uh, the first one is the nature of the charges, which doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about generally here today. It's, you know, it's a drug charge or whatever it is, because there are no, to my knowledge, there are no federal crimes involving domestic violence. Um, the second thing under the, the statute is kind of weigh the evidence. And again, because you're talking about non-domestic violence crimes and the way the evidence doesn't really matter uh, to, to the issue we're talking about today. But that's one of the factors. 
And then, but the third factor has some very specific things to talk about. Uh, the first factor is, um, or first thing is the history and characteristics of the person involved. That's the defendant. And then it lists these other subcategories. One of them is family ties. One of those is um, the length of residence in the community. One of those is criminal history. Uh, one of those is a person's mental or physical uh, characteristics or capacity or condition. Um, another one is uh, history related to drug or alcohol, abuse, which is often part of domestic violence. Um, so those things are all part of it. Um, Travis, have you had cases where you had a person, I think Kim mentioned one, uh, where a, one of your clients you, you were representing wanted to be released and go home to a victim of, of his own or her own alleged domestic violence? I believe we had one, Your Honor, that, uh, again, it didn't turn out well from my, from my side, but it was, uh, in fact, I was trying it with David Harris, but it was uh, a person who had been convicted, gone through Bureau of Prisons on a uh, methamphetamine charge. And then when they got out, they relocated uh, to, I think, the Clinton Cultural, the old Hot Springs High. And during that process, he had gotten uh, moved in with a woman. And uh, to cut to the end, he made one of the worst decisions I could ever think of. As he moved out, he had his new girlfriend help him move out from his old girlfriend. So she made an allegation. No, no, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Which think about that. His new girlfriend helped him move stuff out of his old girlfriend's work. So, and I think that's Christy Constant, who was very reasonable about it, but she believed the victim very strongly. And there was a police officer who was present, Officer Cash, who was very convinced that my client had committed domestic violence against this woman. And one of her statements, I think, was uh, my client had beaten her up and then taken her cell phone. Well, she was, her testimony was very compelling and the officer's testimony was very compelling, but the only thing that saved me was there was video cameras at the Clinton Cultural or whatever it was. And the video cameras clearly showed her walking around freely with her cell phone. But we ended up basically trying, as part of the detention hearing, the domestic battery for three or four hours, which I eventually got dismissed in state court because we had tried it so thoroughly in federal court. But it was certainly one, if I hadn't had those cameras, I think he would have been detained for the entire process of the revocation. Yeah. Bruce, have you had any cases or in your office of where that was specifically where your client wanted to be released to the custody of a prior victim of domestic violence. We have, and, and those are those are difficult. And, and oftentimes, you're trying to find out exactly what happened. And if they have been, if there's a prior conviction, that's one thing. But if there's just the allegation of, of of domestic violence, and that's another. We get a lot of them where there is is an allegation of domestic violence, and as we heard earlier today, you know, just like the court wants to know what else is going on around that situation, so do we. Are they having child custody issues? Are they looking at divorces? Or like Travis's client, do they have a new girlfriend? Uh, there are there are a lot of factors that you have to look at. And to try to determine, and it is not unusual where you will find that somebody makes an allegation of domestic violence, but as Travis's client turned out, the proof is not there that, that it actually occurred. Now, if it is a prior conviction, then, then you know it happened, but then you have to look and you have to see uh, what caused it to happen then. Again, was drugs or alcohol involved? what length of time has passed since that happened. Um, has your client gone through anger management? Have they gone through various courses that, that should help them not to, to re-offend? And so you have to, to just look at all of these factors, but if there's any place for somebody to live other than with a victim, whether it's been proven by a conviction or just an allegation of domestic violence, they need to, live somewhere else, if at all possible, because it's not a good situation. Manuel, your office has a, looks at a criminal history of a person and you see either a protective order or some sort of uh, charge or conviction for domestic violence. What do you do prior to the detention hearing or after, for that matter, when you're getting ready for sentence? What does the probation office do to, to figure out 
what went on with that either arrest or conviction for some sort of domestic violence, sexual violence, that sort of thing. Well, we obviously, the first thing we want to do is find out who the victim was in that case, because if this person's released, our job is to make sure that they comply and get through pretrial. Um, they're either going to a jury trial or they're going to plead guilty. Um, so we want to make sure that they get through this process. So we try to find out who the victim was, um, and if there's no contact order, we want to make sure that we uh, recommend conditions through our court that they have continue to have no contact with this person. Um, it, and of course, sometimes it's, you know, a, uh, a child's, there's a child involved. So you want to dig a little deeper into that and see if there's custody issues there. Um, we always try to get, you know, court records. Um, you know, we ask the defendant about domestic violence, but we also want to get, get the court documents and find out, okay, was this person convicted? What were the details? Read the arrest report. Um, I supervise people on uh, probation and parole with the state for 12 years. And I know that sometimes significant others get mad and, and try to get people in trouble. That does happen. Um, it happened quite frequently on probation parole. They would call probation parole when they were mad at someone. Uh, they wouldn't call the police. They would call us. So we always want to make sure that we find out what happened we we want to investigate that and uh because our job is to get them through this if if they're recommended if the judge orders them to be released we're going to supervise them and and ensure that they don't get back in trouble with the law again that's our that's one of our goals so we want to find out who the victim is and ensure that that person knows stay away if, if it was a sex offense or something of that nature we want to make sure that they're within the guidelines of where they're supposed to be living that type of thing. So that's that's what we do on that end. Ken, what about your office? You just as long as you have a, either in detention or getting ready for a sentencing, that's, that issue sort of washes the same way. Uh, when you have a history of a defendant uh, with either charges or conditions for domestic violence or sexual violence of some sort, um, how does that play into what you do? I mean, how, do, do you uh, approach that directly at the detention hearing? Have you ever heard of one of your lawyers calling a victim as a witness or cross-examining a, a, a witness like Bruce may call who's been an alleged victim in the past? I mean, what, how do you handle that? Well, for, I've never heard of the victim being cross-examined other than the, the time of the, the mother that the defendant was trying to be released to during the actual detention hearing process. Um, I, when we encounter a defendant who has those types of convictions, I definitely think it speaks to the history and characteristics of the person, meaning history and characteristics of that defendant who was there that day for that detention hearing. And so I will definitely weave that into my argument um, because that's my argument for detention because it's important that this person has committed violent offenses. It speaks to the danger to other people in the community, uh, and it speaks to the, the person and their character. It also, as Judge Bryant said, that same argument, while it's a different statute, the, the factors are similar, and it does reappear again later at our sentencing arguments because that history and characteristics of that offender are so important. Uh, but Whenever I see those types of convictions, it definitely stands out to me because they're not as common. Would you agree with that? They're not as common. They're not as common as, as other types of as offenses. drug offenses that you see in someone's past. Those types of convictions or um, breaking or entering those types of convictions. But when you see repeated instances of aggravated assault and then the violation of the no contact order, which is a, something we talked about earlier today, when you see repeat repetitive times where over and over again, this person may have, I mean, I've seen several cases where in the pretrial report, the person will have multiple instances of those types of convictions. And that is frightening. Um, prior to becoming a USA, I was a deputy prosecutor in Little Rock for a long time and spent several years prosecuting domestic violence cases. And so I bring that experience forward with me now and can understand how when you have that type of pattern and, and sure there are times when you have the one time something happened in someone's life and it, it can be explained by 
drugs or alcohol or some other trigger. But these types of cases where there's repetitive instances of convictions and arrests for violence against family members and violence in general uh, definitely catch our attention. And we argue that to the court in support of our arguments for detention. So Ashley mentioned earlier that um, she was talking about some of the um, prohibitions or the, the punishment that can be placed on people who have been accused or convicted of, of domestic violence or abuse. This Title uh, 18 United States Code Section 923G, which is part of the criminal code, uh, which makes it a felony under federal law, uh, to possess a firearm while at the same time you're subject to a uh, protective order or a, an order of protection, I guess is the term of art. Um, <clears throat> so, Kim, back to you on that. It, does your law actually seem to indicate that's not that thing doesn't really have any teeth, uh, that statute? And maybe it doesn't from a state court perspective, I don't know, but have you prosecuted or has your office prosecuted cases based on that provision? We have. We have um, the cases come to us from different agencies, and so it really depends on how we're made aware of the situation. It, it probably happens uh, many more times than we're made aware, but what will happen is an agency will bring that type of case to us, whether it's the ATF or a local agency, and there are certain requirements within the statute itself that you have to meet with your with your papers, basically, your certified court documents. But um, we have prosecuted those cases. And as the judge said, they carry a penalty of up to 10 years. So the penalty can be higher if a person's multiple convicted felon of a particular types of crimes. If they have, I can't remember the three altogether, of, three altogether a series of other kinds of crimes of violence. If they've got those convictions as well, and then they get charged with this. Uh, this 922G charge, what's the what's the function of them? It's a, a 15 to life. It's a 15 year ma mandatory minimum for life. Ruth, have you dealt with any of those kinds of cases that 922G because of a protective order? Was I have not. I've not I've not seen those uh those type of prosecutions. I've, I've seen, seen I've seen a, a few of them. Travis, what about you? Have you seen one of those? Have you been involved in any of those? I had one where uh when the threat let David Ferguson up. Had um, it was in the national forest, and an individual was out hunting on the edge of it. And the rangers went out there, found him with a long rifle, did his search history, and found he was subject to an order of protection. Um, but they charged him just by regular citation. We worked it out through the petty docket. But there was a with the hammer over his head that if you get charged, you won't charge him. Yeah, you, so my, my advice to him is let's get out of here as quickly as possible. <laughs> 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 That's a deal. Yeah, <laughs> boom, right. Amanda, how does that show up on your when you do your records check for a particular defendant? How would that show up, whether they've been convicted of a, a violent crime of some sort, as opposed to this order of protection? What's the can you can you check for those in state court? Because we don't have them. They're, they're all coming out of state court. Yes, yes, we would because usually if we get the case investigated coming to us from the government. So um, and I we have had a case uh, a couple of years ago where as a juvenile, that guy was actually convicted of, or he had order of protection against his mother, uh, and he was also involuntarily committed to a uh, uh, state psychiatric facility. So he was actually going online and threatening to uh, do a lot of uh, activity online with a gun, and he was found to be in possession of a, uh, I believe, a silencer and a machine gun. But he was the investigation came up because he he was prohibited from having a gun uh, because of the those two factors I just just discussed. But yes, uh, we would of course get the state documents that because it will say on there that they're prohibited from having a firearm. How does that come up? I mean, how do you find that information? Um, well, usually on there uh, we would run it's called an access to law enforcement uh, database. I just messed that up. But anyway, it's a it's a nationwide criminal history database, and that it it ties into this person's um, state ID number in all fifty states, and it would show up if they've been convicted of either a misdemeanor or a felony. Um, and it's just basically what the arresting agency and the court puts puts in there. So we do a little further digging and get the actual court documents. And of course, you know, you can get those either online or call the circuit clerk's office, whether that's 
that's originating from and get that and actually see, okay, this person, yes, they were prohibited from having a firearm or this is what, what happened. Because I, I believe we've also had a case where a person had a, a order of protection in Hot Springs and there was a felony. They were found in possession of a gun or they were pulled over and had a gun and they were charged federally. But we definitely make sure in our investigation that we would put what that first document was that prohibited from having that gun. And it would be the court document or the order of protection, that type of thing. And you've actually, you've actually gotten those documents. It's not a criminal conviction, but it's an order of protection. Correct. From a, a circuit clerk somewhere in the state. Correct. That would prohibit them from, from owning a firearm. Yeah. Does that circuit clerk order or that order from the, the circuit court on order of protection, does that show up on a criminal history check, even though it's not a criminal conviction? The order of protection itself yes. shows up? Yes, it does. And it, it will say there's limited information, but it says who they are prohibited from having contact with. So when we initially investigate this person, that's one of the very first things that pops up about them is if they have some type of outstanding order of protection. So we know, okay, we need to look into this uh, because it, you know, if they've never violated that order of protection, they may have never been arrested for that. It may just be a court order that was imposed. Right. right. And, I, and I know that, um, and I've seen those cases before often, not char separate charges under 922 G, but. I've seen many cases where the defendant has an outstanding allegation or an outstanding conviction or order of protection um, when he comes before the detention detention. Uh, typically, there would be a condition that mirrors the order of protection. Is that is that what you guys have seen as well, Kim? If you have a if you have a person who's subject to an order of protection, then you're always going to always request if a person's released that they be prohibited from seeing that person. So then they have a circuit court order and a federal court order. Yes. Like yes, if we have access to the information as through pretrial services or otherwise, where we can say that it's this person is the victim of this order, our defendant needs to stay away from that person. Yes, because the last thing we would want, any of us would want, is for someone who's released on conditions pending trial in federal court to hurt anybody and certainly hurt another person that they already are prohibited from having contact. Because your I know your office has a uh, uh, witness assistance, victim, victims assistance uh, coordinator or person. Does does that office ever get involved with this sort of issue where there's the victims that we're talking about? It's not the victim of the crime charged, but they have been or, or potentially a victim of domestic abuse going forward. Have you ever had that happen? I have never had that happen. Um, I would say that if somehow that person is related to our federal case or would be a potential witness in our case or a potential witness called it at any type of hearing, then our uh, victim witness program uh, would, would help us make contact with them and work with them in that way. But under this exact scenario, I've never had it come up. That's not to say, though, if, if anyone reached out to our office, we would work with them and direct them to the proper authorities. How, would, help. how would somebody, um, somebody who is a protectant under a protective order, uh, they've got a protective order against a, a domestic partner, um, and they know, I think Ashley indicated one of the things she said is she had a case where whoever the, the defendant in the protective order case was was on Facebook showing off our AR-15. How would that person get that information to the government? How would they do that? So a number of ways they could they could call our duty attorney line. We actually have a duty line and an email set up on our website. But the preferred way, just because what we're going to have to do is, is refer that to an investigative agency to investigate it for us, um, would be to contact their local law enforcement agency. And, and if they don't want to do that, they can also call the FBI or any law enforcement and report it with the idea that it will make its way um, through the system to us. I've had several cases, not exactly on point, but cases where social media ended up getting the person <laughs> in the end, because uh, one, one example would be exactly what we just talked about. A person prohibited from possessing a firearm is on social media, and you can prove the day of the possession so that you can um, link that up to the make sure it's after they're a prohibited person. Uh, they're on there with their firearms, uh, long guns, pistols, whatever it may be, uh, displaying it. Maybe I've even seen times where they're threatening people on there. So it, it really, it does happen. Um, 
And unfortunately, and if the per, if the if that defendant already has an open case, then a lot of times the new information will come to us through the original case agent because the parties involved that are the, the victim, so to speak, or the protectant will notify, they'll know what agency's working a case and they'll uh, contact us that way. So. Travis, question for you about something I said earlier when I first started about the kind of socioeconomic status of, of people who are victims of domestic violence, domestic abuse. And I, again, I didn't know that until I started a, a few months ago looking at this issue. You know, a huge number is um, of domestic violence victims are uh, in extreme poverty. I mean, a thousand dollars a month uh, is sort of the average income for a person who's been a victim. Um, can you talk about a little bit about the, the defendants you have represented and what their socioeconomic status is? Um, I mean, you're getting a point in a lot of those cases, so obviously they're a bit of an but uh, do you see the same thing? I mean, it's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I'll tell you what I see, and it's probably all over Arkansas, but Garland County has a lot of rural, well, I shouldn't say that, the Petty Docket area, I guess the five counties, but a lot of rural areas. And what I see a lot is somebody might have a 10 acre farm with three mobile homes on it. And you do run into situations where perhaps they've got a conflict with a brother or somebody who they live on a larger, but we always have to work with probation. And they're very good about trying to cope with a set of rules or those things so the defendant can be advised to do at least have a chance at release. But um, I can think of one particular one that it was an individual who was a pretty large um, dealer of meth. And I think we were doing a detention hearing on him and, and I was trying it to get him to get a, probably a, his uncle, probably an IQ of 60, lived in a very, very poor economic situation, but the alleged drug deals were out of the very house he lived in. And I remember I was trying it to Judge Brian and just to tell you how bad a job I was doing. He stopped it and did a <laughs> sidebar and he goes, my understanding you want the victim to be the supervising agent for your police. And I said, how's it going? And he said, not too well. <laughs> yeah. But same thing with you, Bruce. I mean, you represent uh, defendants. Almost all of them are indigent. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see? Uh, that is consistent with what we usually see. Domestic violence seems to go along poverty lines. Uh, don't know exactly why. I think a lot of times it starts out money's a, a big motivating factor in a lot of domestic violence. It, if there's money issues and it just escalates from there. Um, but but I see I see poverty as being one of the, the key factors. Yeah. Anything else, guys, that we talked about? I'm gonna ask you some questions. I think I've got out of issues here. Uh, things that pop into my mind. Amanda, anything else? I don't think so. Travis. The only thing I was gonna mention, there's a period of time where we had a district judge that was Thick and eventually died. So for a period of about three years, I sat state, 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 right. And so they had jurisdiction over all domestic batteries, um, even some order protections. So when I'd sit over there, and I, I mentioned this even on failure to appear, but I think Bruce alluded to this, which is, you know, sometimes we'll get the pretrial services report and it'll say 20 failure to appear, or it'll say violation of an order of protection. Well, when I used to sit over there, and this is the part with the detention we talked about, but here state is not quite so friendly. And sometimes what would happen is a person might say they want to plead not guilty of the original appearance, but they couldn't make bond. Well, I would come in and let's say they've been in jail 75 days. Well, I hated this as a defense attorney, but as judge, what they would do is say, if you want to plead no contest, you can get out today. They sat there for 75 days waiting for their trial, but the, maybe the state asked for a continuance because they didn't have a witness or that sort of thing and were entitled to one. And so sometimes I think it's a good tip, especially even on failure to appear where I'd have people who got out of ADC and they'd have a hole left Garland or Garland County. Well, I'd tell them if you'll plead, I'll the 20 failure to appear, I'll let you have zero fines, zero costs. Well, then we get the pretrial services report. They're going to get four points. They're going to get not released. All, but sometimes I guess my point is it's not all vanilla, and sometimes it's good to look at the underlying facts, especially when you have nothing else to go on. Absolutely. Ben, any closing thoughts? Just with regard to the statute itself, it does give you a roadmap, although it's very long. <laughs> we were joking about that earlier. The uh, detention statute in federal court is, as the judge said, 18 U.S.C. 3142, and it has a lot of information in there. It's very different than what you'll see in state court, um, and I think that it's just it's just different. Um, but 
all that to say with regard to domestic violence and those types of offenses, it, those things play a tremendous role from my perspective in the factors and what I can argue to the court in these situations when I have defendants who have been convicted or, and you have to be careful when you argue about arrests because they're not convicted, but convicted of those types of offenses. So. First, investigate. That's the main thing that, that I would encourage anybody to do. Look, find out exactly what went on because as Travis said, sometimes it's different than what it appears. Uh, and if it's bad, you need to know it's bad before you go into court. You don't want the government's agent or a government witness to come and lay out just how bad it is. You need to know that on the front end. And detention hearings are interesting in the fact that it says that you're still presumed to be innocent. But one of the things that the court of staff with is to look at the um, weight of the evidence against the person. So it, it's a very interesting dynamic that goes on in a detention here. One thing I'd add about the detention hearings that because a lot of you guys have any are, are not regular criminal practitioners in federal court is that the statute also says, one of the rules of the statute also says uh, that the rules of evidence don't apply in detention hearings. So in a bond hearing in federal court, you don't have hearsay objections. You don't have all that stuff because the rules specifically don't apply. So information like what we've been talking about here today uh, can come in. It can come into the court and the court can hear it, um, even if it's through a third party. Uh, Ms. Jordan and her office testify often about what uh, someone in the defendant's background has told them. And you could never do that in, a, in any other sort of proceeding, really. But it happens all the time, much to Bruce and Travis's uh, chagrin. They don't like that, you know. It's good. <laughs> but that happens all the time. Uh, so anyway. Uh, so with that, uh, any questions here? Uh, Abby, any questions? Yes, Judge. We've got some questions from Zoom Land. Go ahead. Okay, so this person wants to know, is the Western District looking into threat intervention and prevention programs that other districts have employees help proactively mitigate some violent crimes? Um, you're talking about the court or the U.S. Attorney's Office, or do they say? Western District. Ken? <laughs> um, I can say that it is common practice to get information from uh, the FBI and other agencies about threats, especially um, in our current situation, we're seeing more and more of that information coming into the federal agencies and even local law enforcement to investigate those uh, online threats, uh, a lot of online chatter, those types of things. Um, and certainly we work um, hand in hand with U.S. Marshal Service when we have a situation where we think a federal witness is going to be is receiving threats or feeling that outside of the defendant, maybe the defendant's family or friends or colleagues are threatening them. We can work with the agencies that way to help uh, protect the person. I don't know if, I'm, if it's exactly on point, but generally we see it in the form of witnesses um, feeling threatened or possibly CIs. And there's a number of different things depending on the agency that the case is being brought um, forward from how they handle and how they can help with uh, CIs and informants and that type of thing when they're when they're threatened, but. And, and from the court, I don't, you know, the court is not a law enforcement agency. Uh, we rely on just marshals who are part of the Department of Justice. So I'm not aware of anything the court's doing in the West right now. All right, another question here. What can a victim do if the prosecutor made a plea agreement uh, without consulting the victim and she's opposed to the agreement? I'm gonna turn it over to Kim again. So we have to go over our plea agreements with uh, and, and talk to our victims of federal crimes about the pleas in our cases. And um, that's something that I, all offices take very seriously. They will go over those things and discuss what the possibility, what the possible charges for a plea and what that looks like, what the penalties might look like uh, before going forward, uh, we have certain obligations under the law to do that. Um, of course, there might be situations where uh, a victim of a crime does not want to be contacted and does not want to be consulted. I, I've saw that in my time as a state prosecutor, where basically 
early on, um, the person would say, I, I really just want you to take care of this. I don't, I don't want to be a part of this. That's not to say you still, as the prosecutor, you still talk to them and you still try to keep them in the loop because you want them to feel that they're um, getting the justice that they, they may need and that hopefully they'll receive at the end of the process. But Ken, Ken your office has a, a victim witness coordinator that actually deals with crimes that have identifiable victims. That is right? correct. And the federal agencies do as well. They have uh, victim witness coordinators too. So. And, 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 and if there is a crime where there's a conviction and it is a, there is an identifiable victim, unlike a drug crime or, or something like that, uh, within the victim has a right to speak in court at sentencing as well. Which I'm sure Bruce and Travis are always happy. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. anything else? Yes, one more question for now. Do you all have a list of housing providers that are willing to allow defendants to, to reside there? This continues to be a challenge we face, and that's from a person at legal aid. So that's the perspective they're coming from. Housing providers, the only thing the court has, and I demand they can address this, but we, in, in the pretrial um, kind of context, we do have some drug treatment type providers that are uh, inpatient. So that's all we have, and that's pretrial. I don't know about. The housing we provide post trial in federal courts typically in the federal bureau of prisons. But, um, <laughs> I don't know. But pre trial, Amanda, what do we have available pre trial for? And I don't, that question? I don't know that it's really pre trial, it's more post conviction. We have something called the Second Chance Act that if someone releases from prison, or let's say they release from a transitional house, which is the halfway house, and they don't, especially if they're a sex offender and they need to be living somewhere where we know where they're at. We do have the ability to pay for accommodations at a hotel for them for a certain period of time uh, to make sure that they are somewhere stable where we know where they are, where they can register so they don't get it. Because if they fail to register, that's a new charge and they're back in the system. Uh, so we do have that pre-trial. It's, you know, they, they really need to have some stable place to go for us to recommend release. Um, so we don't really deal with that um, as much on pre-trial, mainly post-conviction. There, there are instances where a person prior to trial, and Bruce and, and Travis have both had these instances where their client, the defendant, is on pretrial release and has some issue and just you know can't stop using whatever uh, or can't stop engaging in whatever conduct. And we do have facilities where we can place them in an inpatient capacity for a certain period of time. Um, I think the, the, an additional answer to that question is if a person is released um, from supervision or is acquitted or if the case is dismissed, the, the federal courts, federal government, unlike the state courts, we don't really have the ability to commit someone or, or do something like that. It's just, it's just not something we, we're limited to jurisdiction courts and we, we can't do that. You're probably going to have to look at some kind of private housing, government housing. There's usually restrictions in a lot of apartment complexes. There's restrictions even if you're just have pending charges and your guilt's not been decided yet. So it gets to be difficult. We have trouble that way. Finding if you're looking for a third party custodian for somebody to, to live with, we have to make sure wherever that person is living, that this person could come and live with them. And that presents a lot of times. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, we have a new one. All right. This is a little bit longer. Um, Jennifer Hayes. Is it common after a person is released from an involuntary pickup in a mental facility for the therapist, because a psychiatrist did not make first appointment upon release, to allow the perpetrator to read the document written by the victim to create the pickup order? Is that even supposed to be allowed? To cancel the appointment, much less let them read the victim statement when the victim still lives at the same residence? That's that's beyond my area of expertise. Well, it sounds like to me that would be a state court issue. This is probably going to be an involuntary commitment that they were 72 hour hold, and if they go to the 30 days and they're supposed to you know, stabilize your medication, make appointments for providers, but of course, you're dealing with a person with mental illness. So, you know, they fall apart a lot, but I, I can't imagine a circumstance where that would exist. Yeah, for federal as a state prosecutor, do you remember or have any uh, kind of. I have, this that? is way outside my scale. There, in Pulaski County, there's a lady that handles all of those um or, or i don't know if she's still doing that or not but i i really have i'd be way out yeah. there i'm speculating <laughs> we're, we're guessing mm -hmm. 
One more. Um, is violence related to mental health issues protected by HIPAA? For example, can the police reports be collected? I'm not sure about that, but I think the answer is yes. I don't know. I'm not positive. Yes to the second part? Yeah. I'm not sure. You guys have any idea about that? But what are you talking about? What's, is there an underlying charge that that person was arrested for, or is it just like a, a welfare check type thing? Not sure. I don't think it'd be a HIPAA violation. I don't think the police are covered by HIPAA. Yeah. So not everybody's covered by HIPAA. Right. By it's HIPAA. healthcare providers. Right. So I, I, I don't think the police are covered, so they could certainly give a copy of the form. I mean, the federal courts have certain rules to protect personal identifying information, but we're not we're not HIPAA. Uh, we don't have to be HIPAA compliant. Okay. This person elaborated a little bit more. This was a particular situation they were dealing with. They just said they would not release them. They were picked up by the mental hospital, um, but they appreciate us trying to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yes. Anybody out there have a question at all? Thank you, panel members. Appreciate it.